IB Nation, welcome back to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. We are here on a Tuesday to talk about Notre Dame's big opportunity this weekend when they take on the Clemson Tigers. Notre Dame sitting at 7-2, and two, about to kick off the final three-game stretch of their season, facing off against a Clemson team that is sitting at 4-4, four and four, which is still very strange to say. We haven't been in this area of this realm of the universe in some time, but it's a very interesting matchup. In a, in a large, in a small scope of the season, larger scope of the programs and where things are trending. So we're going to break it all down. Of course, we're going to give you a Clemson preview as well. We're going to talk about who they are as a team, their schedule offensively, defensively, what they do well, what players that they're going to lean on. We're going to break all that down. We're also going to mailbag at the end. So hit those MBs in the chat. I know that you all have been here before for the most part. So MB before the question to make sure that we can understand what is a question and what is not want us to get our attention on this football game, folks. No more Connor Stallions talk. No more Bears making absolutely terrible trades before the deadline today. We're talking Notre Dame versus Clemson. The last really big game on the schedule, Brian, and we were talking about it before the show, this is the last one where if Notre Dame plays their best game and Clemson plays their best game, Clemson could still potentially beat you. They can, right? But the last two games are games where it, as long as Notre Dame doesn't just not show up, they should win their last two football games against Wake Forest and Stanford, even if those teams play their absolute best. But this is a big game. I know we're going to overlook it because it's 4-4 four and four Clemson. They're coming off of a bad loss against NC State. But there is, as we've watched the film over the last couple of days, still a lot of talent on this Clemson team, a whole lot. That's the thing, Ryan. You watch these games live and you're like, you know, this, this just isn't a very good football team. But then when you really break it down, you're like, man, there's still a lot of talent there. And and they just haven't been able to put it together. You know, there's weeks where their run game is good and their pass game stinks. There's weeks their pass game looks like it's coming together and their run game can't go on. Their defense does well pretty much every week. It's a really interesting team, Ryan, because what I would say is I would phrase it like this. If, if Clemson plays their A game and you don't play your A game, they can beat you. Meaning, like, even if you play your B-plus game, they're good enough to beat you. I think if they both play their A game, I still think Notre Dame wins, but it's going to be a great back-and-forth battle. It's not a game where you play your A game. and they Because, like, if Notre Dame played their A game last week against Pitt and Pitt played their A game, it's still a 17-20 point win, in my opinion. It, it's 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 not yeah. even close. You know, it, it maybe even more. It, if Notre Dame plays their A game and Wake Forest plays their A game, it's still a three-touchdown game, in my opinion. Yep. You know, same with Stanford and those type of teams. This is a game where you play your B-plus game and they play their A game, they can beat you. As you mentioned, the next two games, look, guys, we're going to keep it real with you. The next two opponents, it's just show up, do your job, and you're going to win. Now, the degree to which you win is going to be determined by your focus and your execution and all that kind of stuff, but those are just teams that can't beat you if you just, you know, just play a solid game. This team, if you just play a solid game, can still beat you. And that's why this game is big. So when you talk about what's at stake for Notre Dame, Ryan, and you look at just the short, just the immediacy of the 2023 season, this is your last opponent of the regular season that can can beat you, right? right. Stanford can't beat Notre Dame. Wake Forest can't beat Notre Dame. They can win a game against Notre Dame if Notre Dame just comes out and hands them, you know, like Stanford last and they, year. They beat themselves a little bit. Right, yeah, Louisville right. to a degree. Yep. You know, they'd have yep. to even play worse than they did against Louisville. Right. So it's one of those things where it's not just you can't win those that, that they can't win those games, but it's more about Notre Dame not showing up and yeah. and where this is a team that cannot actually beat you. Louisville was good enough to beat you. Duke was good enough to beat you. Ohio State was good enough to beat you. NC State was good enough to beat you. Notre Dame had to play well to win those games. Some of them they they did. Some of them they didn't. This is one of those games. And and so when you look at the 2023 season, Ryan, that right there is is the first thing that's at stake. You have a chance to go yep. eight and two, and ensure yourself of of just keep doing what you're doing, and you're ten and two, and this program's taking a step forward. It you know, well, people talk about well, if they would have done this, if they would have done that. All fair, but that's sure. more of an off season conversation. 
Right now, it's yep. about what can you be in 2022. And right now, they can't be any better than 10 and 2. So, we, right. we're, we're, there, look, we'll have January, February, March, April, May, June, and July to talk about what could have been. Now we're going to yep. talk about what needs to be. And this is the last big potential stumbling block between you finishing 10 to 2, which is a two game improvement over last year. And when you look at the domination in, in which most of the wins were, were achieved, that's a big step, right? And so that's kind of where, where Notre Dame has a chance to be that short term, like not big picture, just not, not, not macro, but very micro focus on 23. This is a big game for Notre Dame. Somebody put on the board, Ryan said, is this the biggest game of Marcus? Could, could this game have the, like be the biggest of Marcus Freeman's tenure up to this point with the premise being you can't change the results of what have already happened. Right. right. Meaning like, can't go back and say, well, yeah, beating Ohio State would have been because you didn't, right? It was more of, can this game be a program-defining win for Notre Dame? We'll see. But what I do know is this game is going to have a, a huge impact on how we perceive the 2023 season. That's what I can say sure. for sure. Because yep. you win this game, you're 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 most likely a 10 and 2 team. Lose this game, and now you're 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 hoping you can get a bowl game. You're a bowl game loss away from being right back where you were a year ago, despite having a better team. So it's a big, big game for Notre Dame and not one that I, I, I get it, guys. I know four and four, two game losing streak, lost to Duke by 21, a team Notre Dame beat, lost yep. to NC State, a team Notre Dame beat, lost to my I get all that, but I'm telling you guys, this is a game Notre Dame's gonna have to play well because Clemson. Ryan, we're gonna get the Florida State version of Clemson this weekend, I think. Like, agree, agree. They're they're gonna they're their backs are against the wall. Mm -hmm. that, you know that freaking Tyler kid from Spartanburg just hand and dabbo on a silver platter. The 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 us against the world talking points that he's gonna mm -hmm. that he he thrives on that stuff, right? Yep. And now he's gonna have that to get his team fired up. Like they're all against us. Nobody think they all think we suck. They're trying to discredit us. Let's go out this week against a top twelve team. Who knows where Notre Dame's gonna be ranked in the playoff? And and show them that that this program is still whatever, you know right. that's going to be the mantra this week. So you are going to get Clemson's absolute best shot this weekend, and Notre Dame is going to have to bring it. And a win would be big. Just yep. just looking at it, twenty twenty three. We'll talk big picture in a second, but just looking at it, twenty twenty three, Ryan, big big opportunity for Notre Dame. Not not look at your resume, beat a great team. No, right. it's just what it would signify and the, the course it would continue to show Notre Dame to be on. Well, and I think that Marcus Freeman still has some progress and some first that he can accomplish in 2023. I mean, you talk about, again, 10-2 and two is, is still not the standard. It still should have been better. There's no doubt about that. But a year after you went 8-4 and four in the regular season and then got to 9-4 and four after a bowl game victory, it could be Marcus Freeman's first 10-win season, potentially. Obviously, if you beat Clemson and you're able to finish business – over the last two weeks of the season. So that would be a first under Marcus Freeman, a first 10 win season. It could also, and we've talked about this a ton. If you're 10 and two and you finish up the season the way you should, Notre Dame is almost a foregone conclusion to be in a new year six game, which again, that's the other monkey on your back. And that would be a first that we haven't seen in this program in a very long time at this point. So 2023 season, there are still things that are either Marcus Freeman firsts or things that the program hasn't accomplished in a while that would still be progress. You could still see progress out of this season. To your point, though, if you don't take care of business and you get a tough draw in the bowl game, then was there actual progress? There's a one game progress in the regular season potentially, but like nine and four is still nine and four at the end of the day. So I think that there are still definitely things to gain in this 2023 season. And obviously, we'll go into the bigger picture here too, Brian, in a in a minute, but. You also are going to play a Clemson team that is at home. We know the home field advantage that that stadium can bring for Clemson, oh, yeah. the energy that that stadium can bring at any time of the day, guys. I know a lot of people are out there are like, it's not a night game. And I get it. Trust me, I get it. At night would definitely be more of a home field advantage. There's no doubt about that. But a 12 o'clock game in that stadium is still going to be juice. There's still going to be a whole lot of energy. Clemson is do or die at this point. I mean, you are four and four. If you fall to four and five, then it's like, dang, man, like we better figure it out down the stretch or we might not make a bowl game this year. Like we're in threat of that happening. So, yes, I think that Clemson is going to be desperate. 
Notre Dame is coming to town. We know that Dabo Sweeney respects the University of Notre Dame and that all week that his team is going to be super locked in. So you are going to get Clemson's best shot, there's no doubt. And their best shot, Brian, if they are playing up to their caliber, right? Because I know 4-4 four and four on paper is bad, but the caliber of player on the team, Clemson is better than a 4-4 four and four record from a talent perspective. They just aren't a very good football team right now. They're not playing up to their talent level. So if you get their best shot on Saturday... Could they beat you? Yeah, they can because they have a lot of talent. They have they've lost one game in decisive fashion, but every other game has been a one score affair of their other but, three losses. I mean, they're a good team. I mean, they're a talented team, I should say, not a good team. You have to see how hard it was for me not to cut you off. Like I'm working on like just not, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, trying to get better at it. Even that one team that it was decisive, Clemson has the ball in the fourth quarter, first and goal at the one yard line. They score, they have a fourth quarter lead. Yep. Right. Like so, so it got away from them late. That was sure. a game, I believe Clemson led 14 7 or 7 6 at halftime, I believe. And then it was a, a yard away from, from uh, taking a lead in the fourth quarter. So even that game that was, to your point, decisive, it, it that just goes to show like f- stats can be misleading because they lost by 21 to, to Duke. I would say that was a far more competitive game than the seven point loss to NC State where they were down big and kind of clawed back and, and never really, you never thought they were going to win that game. In my opinion, maybe, you know, maybe a couple drives late, boy, you get a score here, but you just got thoroughly outplayed. But to your point, I mean, this is a team that went toe to toe. I mean, go ask Florida state if Clemson's still a tough place to play in the afternoon. They're right? literally a Florida missed field goal away from being the only team Florida state has lost to. Right. 29 yard field goal from a kid who just got called up to the team that week. He was getting ready to start a job in New York. You're that kid making a field goal away from Florida State being 7-1 and one right now and Clemson being ranked because who knows what that would have done for their confidence level as a football team. Notre Dame, yeah. in my opinion, Ryan, is as I said, is going to get that version of, of Clemson. I, I, I believe agree. they're going to get that version of Clemson. And then the other part of it too, Ryan, is I, I think when you when you look at it, this season, you know, we, we talked about what it means for this season, and, and I think big picture, it, it has implications as well, and, and we'll get into some of the Notre Dame versus Clemson big picture implications, but to me, I want to kind of start off with, you know, what it means for Notre Dame big picture uh, Im- implications, yeah. because I still don't know that Notre Dame has proven itself that it can consistently be a good football team on the road, and when you look at Marcus Freeman's tenure on the road, Ryan, it's it's low hit or miss, you know, it, yes. it, it really is, and so you know, when you look at, at at Notre Dame these these past couple seasons, and you look at what they've been able to do on the road, they've got some very good road wins. You this year, you beat NC State convincingly. You had a come from behind win over Duke, but they didn't play well that game. They just had better players than Duke. That that I mean, you and I talked about in the post game show, Ryan. That that's that's all that game was about. You yeah. got better players than they do. That that's the only reason Notre Dame won that game. Uh, yeah. Louisville, they didn't play well at all. Got their butts kicked in the second half. Last year, they lost at Ohio State. They beat UNC convincingly. Good win over Syracuse, and then you lose to UNC. So right now, Marcus Freeman's 4-3 and three in true road games, meaning you yep. play the game on the campus of the opponent opposing team. I'm not counting the two Navy games or the BYU game. I'm talking about where you're playing in front of their fans, their student section, their comfort level. They woke up in their own beds, all of that type of thing. You're 4-3 and three right now. And yep. – and, they, there's there's a lot to prove in that regard because right now I feel comfortable that if Notre Dame's playing at home, you're in for you're in for trouble most likely. You know, I mean, really, ever since the Stanford game, Notre Dame has just been a completely different home team. Even the game they lost to, Cle- to Ohio State, Notre Dame played well in that game. They did, right? They didn't play well enough to beat a really good team, but that's a team right now that's got a shot to be the number one you know seed in the college football playoff in tonight's ranking. And you took them down to the wire. Notre Dame is a very good home team right now. We are still learning if they can be that kind of team on the road. There's been a big disparity yep. between home and away since really coming out of Stanford. Yep. If you look at the entirety of Marcus Freeman's tenure, sure, it's about the same. But I, I Notre Dame, Ryan, Notre Dame's been a way different team since Stanford. They're way different yep. team since Stanford last year. And, and so this is another opportunity for us, for you to show as a program, show to us as a program, hey, I don't care where we play the Notre Dame standard travels because would you agree that that has not been the case? The standard yep. doesn't always travel. The The focus, 
all of those things doesn't necessarily travel. And we're going to find I mean, out if uh, they can do that. I mean, it has in the last couple of games. I mean, like we talked about it. I mean, you did not. I mean, you came out OK against Duke, but then you just weren't able to put stuff away and you weren't able to finish drives and you weren't able to separate yourself from the Duke. And then Duke put you took you down to the to the wire, obviously, when they kind of punch you in the mouth, especially in the second half. And, you know, you, you came down and there was desperation and you had to convert as fourth and 16 like Notre Dame just. They didn't sleepwalk through Duke. I just thought they got thoroughly right. outplayed against Duke as right. far as from a technical and coaching perspective. They just got outplayed. And then Louisville happens, the other true road game that, of recency that we're talking about. And you got punched in the mouth from start to right. finish. I mean, so, right. yeah. you And that's also ACC opponents on the road. And all due respect to Duke and Louisville, but if you're having trouble getting energy in front of those types of teams and there's disgruntled fans or whatever, quote-unquote, right? Uh, just wait until the eighty thousand at Clemson right. Stadium this weekend when right. you're when you are the hunted and you have a target on your back because you are a better right. team than Clemson and they know it and they have to punch you in the mouth and again man they have talent to punch you in the mouth if they come right. out swinging it's it's going to be an interesting one it's going to be interesting because we haven't really seen a desperate Clemson team in a little bit no. right like they've kind of been the no. they've been the front runner for a little bit now right. they've been that team on top they've been kind of looking down at folks. Right now, Notre Dame is the hunted. Clemson's not the hunted right. for Notre Dame right now. Notre Dame is the hunted from Clemson. They this want is to the hunt season that saving win for them. This is the yeah, season exactly. season salvaging win for them. You know, when you look yep. at what Clemson has left on their schedule, Ryan, to your point, if you lose to Notre Dame, you know, you look at your four and five, your next three games are home against Georgia Tech. Okay, maybe should be a win, but here's what I know. I'm going to play the transitive property just a little bit. Right. That's a team that just beat Miami at Miami, something Clemson could not do. And then you've got a home game against North Carolina. You never know what to expect from the Tar Heels. And then you play at South Carolina, who's struggling right now. But, you know, so's Clemson. And, and, and where's Clemson's headspace at if they lose this football game? Like if Clemson wins this game this week uh, against their name this weekend, I think they run the table. If they lose, they could be in trouble. And, and that's something yep. that we'll discuss here in a little bit, Ryan. But if you lose this game, you're four and four on the road in the last like in true road games the last two seasons that that's a bad sign if you win yeah. however you're five and three and you've won you know what be five of your last seven right because you you go back to the ohio state game and you'd be three and four in the road this this season against true road teams all acc teams by the way, Notre Dame got stuck with four road games against ACC opponents this year and you go three yeah. and one on the road and it signifies, especially if Notre Dame, and look, even if Notre Dame only wins, like if Notre Dame wins by a field goal or a touchdown because Clemson brings it and it's just a two talented teams battling, I'm fine with that. Like I don't have, like, if yeah. you don't win by 17, win, right? That's all. Yes. Win. This I'd like to win. see him play. <laughs> right. I'd like to see him play well. But yep. if they play well, as I said earlier, in my view, if Notre Dame plays their A game and Clemson plays their A game, I think Notre Dame wins, but it's a battle. It's a battle. It's going to be a competitive game. That's all. Just get that W. This is one of those games, Ryan, where it's like survive in advance for me, right? You got yep. another bye week coming up. If you know, if, if leave it all on the table, coach, right? Physically and all that kind of stuff, because you got another bye week coming up. And if you win this game, all of a sudden, you're you're you've truly taken off from that team that had their backs against the wall because Clemson is now in the situation I believe Notre Dame was as, as their from a headspace standpoint. Right where Notre Dame had played three really physically tough games in a row, emotionally tough games in a row, and and just you'd lost two of the three Notre Dame had. Clemson's in a situation where they've played three really tough games in a row. They had a, a yep. tough game against Wake Forest at home. Then they lost two in a row on the road at Miami and North Carolina State. Again, two out of your last three, you're tired, you're fatigued, your your backs are against the wall. The aspirations you had coming into the season have been pretty much eliminated. So how do you respond? Notre Dame responded incredibly well. They responded by beating their next two opponents 106 to 27. You yeah. have to be prepared if you're a Notre Dame football team to get that type of response from Clemson. Now, sure. the difference is, is Notre Dame's better than USC and 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 Pitt, where they can take those blows, punch back, and still win. 
but you have right. to be prepared for that team to show up. You have to be prepared for the Florida State version of Clemson to show up today that yep. played tough in the trenches, that made big plays on both sides of the ball, and took a really good football team down to the wire. And if Notre Dame can face that and win that, that's a great sign for Notre Dame. And it yeah. really gives them some momentum. And for the second year in a row, you're going to finish your season off on a very strong note. And it'll show again that Notre Dame can truly turn the corner from adversity. Not for a short period of time, just a couple games, you beat up teams you're better than, but then you go play a team that can physically punch you in the mouth, which Pitt and USC couldn't do, and you go back again, right? Take yeah. that punch and keep charging. And that's what I want to see from Notre Dame. And if they can do that, they're going to win this football game, right? I have no doubt about that. I really don't. But it's going to be a battle. That's the thing yeah. that, I, that I would say. I, I mean, because, I, 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 guys, I know that some people are just going to overlook Clemson and just be like, they're 4-4. Four and four. They just are coming off a bad loss to NC State. They're not a good football team. And I understand why our minds go there. But I also think if we – it, if we just ignore the like, we can't just ignore the context of the schedule, though, is like the simple fact of, yes, they have a, a couple bad losses and a couple close losses. But to your point, Brian, they also did take Florida State, who is in contention to be in the playoff this year down to the wire. And I would argue they probably should have won that football game in regulation. I would argue that they were winning. And then Florida State scored later, and then they came back and and had a game-winning field goal that wasn't very far of a field goal either. They had a chance, multiple chances, to win that football game against Florida State. So, yes, this is not a vintage Clemson team. This is a very volatile Clemson team because from a week-to-week -week perspective, you don't know 100% which team you're going to get or at least which version you're going to get. But this will still be a, a big victory for me because – Getting to eight and two and having a clear path to ten and two and then a New Year Six Bowl that still matters, guys. We can shake our heads and be like championship no. or bust, but like that still matters in the current state of Notre Dame football that hasn't won a New Year Six Bowl since when? When was the last time? I mean, we talk about these kids that we want to win championship. Nineteen ninety four, January first, nineteen ninety four. They beat yep. Texas A and M. I think it was twenty four to twenty. No, twenty eight to three. I yep. believe is is was the score of that game. It was um. It was the uh, the end of the 1993 season, yes. so that is the last time that Notre Dame, last time Notre Dame beat a team on a new in a New Year's actually was 24 21 28 three was the year before 24 21 Kevin McDougal was your was your quarterback the last time Notre Dame won a New Year's Six Bowl right and and, and like you can talk about about Clemson Ryan is somebody in the chat you know saying you know Clemson's terrible and I, I can understand why people think that because they look at who they lost to and they look at the record and that's totally uh, it's fair I think sure being uh, you know it's fair but my point is if if the if the team that shows up against Florida State shows up the rest of the way this is a six and two ranked football team right right that's a fact it's a six and two ranked football team and now there's something even I mean they're Kate and the point is Okay, but they didn't do that. They didn't bring that week after week. And that's the point you were making, Ryan, that volatility is you don't know what you're going to get from Clemson week after week. Are you getting the, the team that barely beat Wake Forest? Or are you getting yep. the team that 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 took Florida State down to the wire and honestly should have won that football game? Which version are you getting? That's why and Notre Dame has to focus on – Notre Dame has to anticipate we're going to get their best shot. And I – if – look, these kids – grew up in an era on Notre Dame's team, grew up in an era where Clemson was the dominant team, if at, at best, at worst, the co-dominant team of these kids' lives, along with right. uh, at Alabama. Most of the kids from Notre Dame were either in middle school or high school when Clemson won their two titles. Right. right? And so they're they're gonna be they're gonna know they're gonna still see Clemson and know, hey guys, this is still Clemson, right? And and we they're, need to bring it. You can't be thinking about 35 14 last year or four and four. Right. You got to expect their best shot. Right. There's name recognition to this game, which obviously when we get to the bigger picture, Brian, like recruiting <laughs> recruiting pulse that can kind of move forward there and just kind of because again, I think that we forget because there, you know, we do have some older guys in the chat as far as like being in the golden area of Notre Dame football, and they lived it, right? They saw national championships. They saw Heisman Trophy winners. They saw it all. But what we're forgetting is that this Notre Dame team in 2023 is filled with 18 to 24-year-olds that have no idea what that feels like, right? They weren't alive when you won your last New Year's Six Bowl. They weren't alive when you won your last national championship. They weren't alive your last Heisman Trophy winner. 
this team still needs to feel that, right? They need still need to feel that type of success, feel what that tastes like, right? And getting again to 10 and two and potentially winning a New Year's Six Bowl is big for this version of this Notre Dame yes. team because then going into next year, it's like Jaden Greathouse and you're whoever your starting quarterback is and offensive linemen coming back and Xavier Watts maybe coming back and Benjamin Morris coming back. They know what success feels like. They know right. what that tastes like. And that right. urges you typically the great teams to the next step, right? The next step, the next step. So there's a lot on the line for the rest of this year and particularly and this weekend. Let's talk even bigger picture now, Ryan, and finish yep. this conversation up with an even bigger picture conversation. And where where I'm going to come from on this, Ryan, I'm not jumping ahead. You right? Or am I on track of, of 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 this one? Yeah, you're good. Yep. You know, bigger picture. You know, are we going to learn about this football team? Can they be consistent? Can they, you know, can they roll? Can they really string together kind of games? All that kind of stuff, which we've yep. which we've discussed. Can they go on the road and win? Those are all important big picture things as well, not just for 2023, but even bigger picture specifically to Notre Dame and Clemson. Notre Dame is trying to get here. It's the top of the it's the top of the mountain. Yep. To get to the top of the mountain, you have to overcome certain teams that are ahead of you right now. You had a chance to do that against Ohio State and you missed it, right? And and I know moral victory, all that. I, there are you're at the point now where there aren't moral victories anymore. You came yep. up short, but you you know you are close. With the struggles that Clemson is having, combined with the fact that like overall, like just this season, combined with the fact that a win this weekend for Notre Dame means you've won three out of four against Clemson, and that to me would signify that you have now passed them as a program. And right. I think there's also, and this may not be something that the team feels, and I don't know that it's something that Marcus Freeman would feel. I hope that he does. I hope that there's people around Marcus Freeman that have been at Notre Dame long enough to explain to him the bigger picture aspects of what this game means for Notre Dame and Clemson, because Clemson's dynasty, according to their head football coach, now I actually disagree with it. I actually think their their dynasty began in, in 2013. You know, when they when they had that really good 11-2 season and beat Ohio State and then come out in 2014 and you finally beat South Carolina. And, you know, I think that was the build to 2015. They view the Notre Dame game as the game that put them on the map where Clemsoning was killed. The Clemsoning yeah. phrase, all that stuff was was done away with. You could no longer do it. And that, that, that Dabo has, Coach Sweeney has argued, that set them off to where they then went on the run beat Florida State that year, beat South Carolina that year. Remember, South Carolina back then still had Steve Spurrier, and they had beaten Clemson five years in a row, usually convincingly, and and then went on and played Bama toe-to-toe -to -toe for 60 minutes, came up short, come out the next year, and win a national championship. And then two years later, or a year later, you're back in the playoff. A year after that, you win another championship. year after that, you're playing in the title game. year after that, you're back in the college football playoff. And even their struggles of the last two season, they, seasons, they won 21 football games, right? This is still a good football program. You have a chance to knock them completely down to where you can now say, we are better than you now. Because this season, we talked about this during the preseason, right? This season moves us out of the, it's been five years since Clemson won. It's now been six years since Clemson won their six seasons since Clemson won their title. So when we're talking about who the best programs are next year, why did we include Clemson ahead of Notre Dame this past year? Because we looked at it as a five-year, five-season span. So 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. If you go to 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23, guess what? Guess how many wins Clemson has over Notre Dame in that span? Zero, right? Yeah. And so now all of a sudden you can say, hey, we have passed this program. And I think it's also symbolic for, for the Notre Dame program to be able to say that because, Ryan, you and I, when we're talking about recruiting, Clemson is still a team we see listed a lot yeah. for Notre Dame. There's still a lot of kids that Notre Dame has lost to Clemson. There's still kids yeah. on that Clemson roster right now that you say Notre Dame wanted that kid. And, boy, if they had him, you know, insert what we think Notre Dame would be right now. You right. start putting them behind you like – it, to where you're now the better program, where you now start winning some of those battles, that's the kind of thing that Notre Dame needs to keep chopping away at those teams until they get to the top. So there's that's also at stake this weekend. Plus, it would be really 
I don't know, ironic. I don't know if that's the proper word to use here, but you have a chance to be the team that Clemson attributes to the beginning of their rise, and you have the team that can put the final nail in the coffin of that Clemson dynasty. And I think a Notre Dame win this weekend at Clemson, dropping them to four and five, pretty much does that. Unless Dabo yeah. can do a complete reboot. It, whereas if Clemson wins, then they're, they're, they're the plug hasn't been pulled yet. They're still on life support, but the plug hasn't been pulled yet. Notre Dame yeah. has a chance to 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 end it this weekend, in I'm, my opinion. I'm trying to think of what that word would be. I mean, it's like poetic, maybe po- poetic. Yeah, I mean, poetic you know, work. Co- could definitely you know, work. Like cosmic. You know, car, car, I don't know, like what the word would be, but yes, poetic would be one of those. Yeah, you know. yeah, po- poetic's a good one. It's it's it was meant to be, right? It's it's like it's. Yeah, yeah, I, I think poetic works for that because that that would be a very interesting sequence. Notre Dame starts it on the wrong end. Notre Dame finishes on the better end, obviously. And right. you mentioned recruiting, Brian. I mean, just in my couple years here now with Irish Breakdown, I mean, we've seen it a couple times, right? Like we saw Ronan Hannafin in 2023, a guy that Notre Dame really wanted wide receiver out of the state of Connecticut or state of Massachusetts, excuse me. We saw just 2025 already. Notre Dame really liked Gideon Davidson early on in this process, the running back, and he ends up picking Clemson as well. They were looking at the quarterback. Uh, the uh, what was the kid's name that played with Preston Zinter, the, the quarterback? Yeah, the kid there. from um, from Massachusetts. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that they liked in the twenty. Now it ended up working out well for Notre Dame. Yes, it did. With, but Notre uh, Dame was going to give that kid a serious look. Kid, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Blake Hebert. They were going to give that kid a serious look, and then he picked Clemson, obviously. Right. So didn't peak his interest quite enough in, in order to kind of slow down that recruitment towards Clemson there. So we have seen Clemson still win a couple of these recently, but I think from the recruiting side of it, from this big stretch is that you are starting to win more and more of those battles over the last couple of years. I feel like, you know, Notre Dame winning with guys like Sullivan Absher last year, for instance, like that was a big victory over Clemson mm-hmm. for, for, you know, for just one example. But as you continue to win more of those battles, and the on the field shows that Clemson is no longer, I don't even want to say big brother, but like they are the superior program that you can put that all stuff that stuff to rest, right? Because that's always been the that was the the pitch for us for a few years there, right, Brian? Is that like Clemson's yeah. competing for national championships? They are relevant, they are college football relevant, they're competing for playoff bursts, they're the the champ of the ACC every single year, just a battle. Right. They, they had that name power to them, and Notre Dame has a chance to end that name power. Here's another thing, Ryan. You know, we we sometimes when we look at these things, we first rightly we first look at the battles between Notre Dame and that team, right? And and then it, it then it can shift a little bit, right? You know, you talked about Ronan Hannafin. And then it's not just okay. What about the teams that that the players that they beat you for? But then it gets into can you now put yourself in the ball game for guys that they landed that wouldn't give you the time of day that you offered? And, and a perfect example is last year's Clemson class. How are we feeling about Notre Dame's 2023 recruiting class if they got Peter Woods or Vic Burley, who are yeah. dudes, right? Now, yes. they didn't offer Tamorian Parker. I don't know if he didn't have the grades or if it wasn't a fit or he was already committed to Penn State, so they didn't make a run at him or not. But I know they offered Peter Woods and tried to recruit him. He wasn't interested. And he goes to Clemson. I know they offered Vic Burley, tried to recruit him. He wasn't interested. You know Why? Because Clemson is still perceived as that program that can go out and compete for a championship. You combine a win over Clemson with a beatdown of USC and the fact that you can look at them and say, hey, guys, Ohio State was one play better than us. That's it. Right. Right? Now – you could say that's spin. Yes, it is spin, but there's also merit to that spin. It's not you're not making it up out of out of whole cloth, right? You could say, hey, look, we had we had chances to win that game. We didn't make the plays they did, so we're not there yet. But with you, we get there, right? The next Vic Burley. Hey, if you're there, that quarterback doesn't have time on third and 19 to make that play, right? That's the selling point, right? Hey, if you're a big time safety that otherwise wouldn't give us a look, man. If we had you at safety, you know, and you don't say it quite like this, but they know. Right, man, I, I would have made that play. I would have made that play. And Notre Dame beats Ohio State, and they're in the college football playoff. And so it's also that. It's not just, okay, now you can beat Clemson head-to-head, but now you get on the radar because it's a compilation of, of this win plus the USC win plus other things, you know, where you're now on the radar of these of these kids where it's it's not just 
you know, maybe the next time Christian Wilkins comes along, he does a, a, a private school kid from Connecticut who's a very high academic kid, yes. great student. I mean, kid in five years got what two degrees at Clemson? I, I think he graduated two, two and a half years? at his first degree. So right. yeah. Yep. And and you know, a kid that would be a great fit at Notre Dame, why did he go to Clemson? Wanted to compete for championships. Yep. And at the time, Notre Dame was a team that was eight and five. They had the one 12 and 0 season, but then everything else was eight and five, eight and five, nine and four, eight and five. I mean, he wasn't going to go there. Now, all of a sudden, yep. maybe the next Christian Wilkins that comes along that otherwise might go to Clemson, maybe he now comes to Notre Dame. That's why this game matters, big picture for Notre Dame. It's not just about, you know, and ending the Clemson, Clemson dynasty so us fans can pound our chests and feel good about it. There's practical reasons why doing so or being the per team that's perceived to do that can have that kind of implication because a week before yeah. the Notre Dame USC game, everybody's oh, Caleb Williams, Heisman front runner, and Notre Dame just broke USC. They broke Clemson last year. You just have to not allow them to revive themselves in this game, right? I yep. mean, Clem what did I what did I have it? Clemson since since the Notre Dame game, Clemson is seven and six. They were undefeated coming into that game. They were what eight and zero, I believe eight and zero coming into that game, yeah. Ryan. So and great. they've it's coming. And if you include that game, they're seven and seven. But they're seven and six since that game, and that was really the only game where Clemson just got destroyed. Even the bowl yep. game, 31-14, we talked about this yesterday, I believe. They missed like three field goals, faked a field goal, another one didn't get it. Like that was a much closer football game than 31-14. to But Notre Dame physically beat Clemson's butt. That hadn't yep. really happened to them before. The closest thing that you could say was maybe the Ohio State game in 2020, but I still think that was an athlete game, just like the LSU game in 2019. Those were athlete games. Notre Dame broke Clemson's will in my opinion, last year. And they haven't been the same. Now you have a chance to end it. And, and ending it doesn't just hurt Clemson. It helps Notre Dame. And that's why, you know, now that does shouldn't matter to Sam Hartman. That shouldn't matter to Joe Alt and, and Howard Cross and Benjamin Morrison and J.D. Bertrand and Xavier Watts. shouldn't matter to them at all. But yep. to Marcus Freeman and the recruiting staff, that nice. absolutely needs to matter because that's what you're selling coming out of that game. Talking to, you know, I'm hey, Ivan Taylor. Guess what, man? This is what this is who we are now. You know, hey, hey, Bryce Davis, who's from North Carolina, who's looking at Clemson because they're local. Yeah, you can stay close to home and you know be part of that program, or yeah. you can come up here and compete for a championship. Like, when was the last time Notre Dame could say that about in a battle against Clemson? Against right. Clemson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you're not wrong. I mean, I, I always just think about more players like Isaiah Campbell, who's another. Carolina kid where it's like, Hey yeah. buddy, like, why, why don't you come up North? Cause the yeah. other implication is it's not only just a name brand of Clemson, but we're also talking about a school in South Carolina. This is a Southern school, right? Like I know when we say Southern schools, people just usually think about just sec schools, but Clemson still counts there. Right folks. So like mm -hmm. Clemson's going to have state power, not only in the Carolinas, but like Georgia all the way down to Florida. Like those kids are, are, high on Clemson as far as what they have been and what they can sell and then being a Southern school as well. So they have all those implications ready for them on the recruiting side of things. I actually like that this is an away game that we're talking about right here, because you are going to be in front of that demographic, that level of fan base, that just type of players that you were targeting because we have seen already 2025, Two Florida kids already committed in the 2025 class, a big-time quarterback from the state of Mississippi, a pass rusher from Alabama, a running back from Arkansas. You want to continue that trend? You beat the Southern schools like Clemson on their home turf and show that you have surpassed them as a football yep. team. There's a lot at stake there yep. from a recruiting side. There's hey, no doubt. Hey, uh, next time Sammy Brown comes along, yeah. next time Ricardo Jones comes along, right, guys in the 24 class, hey, man, Sammy, this is what you missed out on. This is what you could have been a part of. And and Sammy right? and Sammy likes Notre Dame, right? But it was just yeah. like, why would I leave the South to go to Notre Dame? Why would I do yeah, that? Yeah, I can go what, up to Notre Dame and compete for a championship, but I can just stay about 120 miles away from home and stay here and compete for a championship. Right. Exactly. It's like I can go to Clemson or I can go to Georgia. Why would I go up to South Bend, Indiana? Right. You know what I mean? Right. And I, I don't I don't right. blame him necessarily for that thought no. process. I really don't. Right. But you've got to show yourself that no, no, guys, there's something different here. And this is the kind of game that can can mean that. So yes. big picture, short term, Ryan, all of it 
has it, it's it's a big game for Notre Dame, and, I, and 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 I can just I can tell by some of the responses in the chat, and I'm not trying to I'm not calling the chat out. It's 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 at all, but you can I think I think there are some people that just look at the record and just ah just another mediocre team. They 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 are to a degree, right? You're you are who, what your record says you are when it's all said and done, right? Yeah, we're talented, but you're still not a good team right now. Sure. Notre Dame needs to make sure that happens, but this is a big win, a, a, a big, excuse me, not a big win. It's a big opportunity for Notre Dame that goes beyond just you beat a four and five football team, which is what they would be if you win that game. There's right. much more to it, much bigger stakes here for Notre Dame uh, than, than just that win. And that's why, that's why this is a huge, huge game for Notre Dame. Yep. Huge game huge. for Notre Dame and, and a huge opportunity for Sam Hartman too. If you want to kind of get big picture, because this is a kid who hasn't been able to beat Clemson in his career. Yeah. And, he's, for three. and he's, isn't he from South Carolina or he's from North Carolina. He's from North Carolina. He's Carolina, Carolina kid yeah. still regardless. So he knows, he knows. So, yeah. yeah. So he has an opportunity there. Obviously Notre Dame has a big opportunity just in general. And again, I go back to my my main point earlier, Brian, before we transition into talking about Clemson, the team that we see on the field and what they bring to the table, is that for Notre Dame, this current Notre Dame team, the players especially that are going to be back in 2024, they, they have a chance to end this thing down the stretch, beating Clemson, maybe winning a New Year Six Bowl, and tasting something that Notre Dame hasn't tasted in a long time, and they certainly haven't tasted in their lifetime, so... Big opportunity down the stretch here for Notre Dame. There's no doubt. From a small, from a smaller scope, from a larger yeah. scope, a lot to gain for the Notre Dame program. This week it starts. All right. We ready to talk about Clemson, man? Ready for yes, it? Sir. Now we it. can dive into actually who Clemson is and we can explain yes. why yep. this game concerns us. But also, Ryan, why I understand why people kind of look at this game and just assume this should be a rollover game because you watch the film, Ryan, and you're like, this isn't, this isn't your old, you know, you say this isn't your grandfather's, whatever, this isn't your older brother's Clemson, right? Like this right, is it's not, yeah. <laughs> this is not that Clemson team because those Clemson teams knew how to win and this team doesn't, but they're still dangerous, which we'll get into, but let's just kind of quickly go over the Clemson season so far, Ryan, obviously a season opening yep. loss to Duke on a Monday night. A loss, mm -hmm. lost. Uh, you had the ball first and goal at the one yard line in the fourth quarter with a chance that you were down 13 7 with a chance to take the lead. Fumbled the ball. Duke ran it. I believe they got all the way past midfield on the fumble recovery, punched it in the end zone, and all of a sudden it's 20 to 7. It was ball game. That was just a, a, a game defining uh, game uh, opportunity for Clemson. Come out next week, smash Charleston Southern, who's obviously not very good. They beat Florida Atlantic convincingly, who's not very good. Took Clemson, Florida State down to the wire. They were up ten to they were up ten to seven, then jumped up seventeen to seven. Florida State came back, uh, made it 17-14 at halftime, and then they tied it up seventeen seventeen. Clemson went up twenty four seventeen. Florida State tied it up twenty four twenty four. I believe in the fourth yep. quarter is when Florida State tied yes. it up twenty four twenty four. Clemson did. drove, and it was about a minute and a half left, and they line up to kick a twenty nine yard field goal, and guy misses it. And then they go in overtime and Florida State wins in overtime. And once he missed that field goal, you you knew it was over. That was their chance to win. You knew that Florida State wasn't going to lose that game at that point in time. But again, that was a toe-to-toe. -to -toe, and it wasn't the Florida State played bad. I mean, the, the mistakes that Florida State made in that game, a lot of them were because Clemson forced them. If They, they played a really good football game. And, and the, the touchdown that tied the game up, it was 24-17. Clemson was driving. They were in Florida State territory when yep. Cade Klubnik fumbled that ball that Kalen Deloach, Deloach ran back for a touchdown. Like, again, yep. another moment where Clemson was on the verge of putting a team away or taking a lead. That would have been a tough one to come back from for Florida State if Clemson goes down there and punches that one in the end zone. The way that, the way that Clemson's defense was playing in that game, I don't know that Florida State's got two touchdowns left in them the rest of the way. But they didn't make it happen. Great. Come out the next week, they bounce back really well. Beat a, a, a at the time Syracuse is playing much better football. That's a weird team, by the way. We'll talk about that another time. Come back Man, and they, beat a quality. They suck against Virginia Tech this but week. They, they just they, they just do that, right? They'll start off six and zero and then lose the rest of their game. Start off four zero this year and they've lost four straight. It's a very weird program. Clemson started their slide by going on the road, beating them thirty one to fourteen. Had an ugly, sloppy win over Wake Forest. But they got it done. 
And then they had the bye week, and you're like, okay, Clemson, they're gonna they're gonna rest, they're gonna recover, they're gonna come back motivated, ready to go. They've got two tough road games, but they got rest. They they're, they've won two games in a row. Like I said, they were they were ranked 26th in the like they were 26th in like the first team with the most votes that didn't make the top 25. You go on the road and beat Miami, you're in the top 25. You know, NC State, you're you're in the top 20, and then you got Notre Dame at home, and you you've got all your all your everything you want to play for still right there in front of you because there's a pretty good chance Clemson at two losses is still getting in the ACC title game with a chance to get their revenge against Florida State. Didn't happen. Lost in overtime to Miami, another game that they led and then blew the lead. And then NC State, I would say, outplayed them. Ryan, that was the one game where just they yeah. flat out got outplayed. It wasn't about them necessarily making mistakes, although they still made plenty of mistakes. They just got beat that game, in my they opinion. Did. They just yeah. they just got beat in that game. And that's where they are, four and four. They're a yeah. they're a four and four football team. That's that's who Clemson is right now. And I think this perfectly illustrates how volatile of a team this is, right? Because again, if you watch that Duke game, that game was a whole lot more competitive than what the twenty eight to seven was. It was just Clemson fumbling and not making key stops in certain situations, allowing Riley Leonard to bust one on a third and whatever scramble drill for a big game. I mean, it, it was. It was a it was a ugly contest in that regard. one of four in the red zone, Ryan. Yeah, oh, they Clemson were terrible in the red one zone. One of terrible. four in the red zone, not not touchdowns total. Yeah, yes. So <laughs> it, it it adds to your point of that wasn't a beat a Duke beatdown where they just came out and beat them twenty eight seven. Wasn't like right. that. No, no, they didn't dominate them start to finish. Duke made the plays that they needed to. They were better with taking care of the football. Clemson shot themselves in the foot all night. And then you almost take a Florida State team that's a good football team down in the wire. That's an 8 no football team that has a chance to win the ACC and potentially contend for a playoff spot this year. A good football team. And I would, mm -hmm. again, argue, if you watch that football game, I thought in the fourth quarter that, no, that Clemson had more chances to win that football game than Florida State had chances to win that football game. Right. I mean, Clemson was front-running, and then they had a chance again with a 29-yard field goal. I mean, that, guys, for reference... You add 17 to where the ball is on the field for a field goal. That ball was on the 12 yard was snapped at the 12 yard line yep. on this 29 yard field goal. Like that's it's just a bad loss. It's a bad loss again mm -hmm. when you outplayed a team that is better than you right now and that a team that is yep. has national relevance this year. And then you come in back to back weeks again. I know Miami you know, the U has been a Good team at times, a average team at other times. Like they're kind of a little bit volatile as well, but they get that victory in overtime, and then you just get smacked against NC State. Yeah. Like I don't know what else to say about that game. I watched. And they the lost game, to a like, freshman quarterback against Miami right. as well. So it wasn't yeah. like they oh, lost Henry to Williams. Night. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's just been a brutal two game stretch for Clemson. Now getting limping into this game against Notre Dame, you have to. I, I'm just very curious what their mindset is coming into this football game, Brian, because it's Dabo Sweeney. So I assume that he's going to have his guys locked in and ready to go. And I'm sure that they'll be, you know, have juice to them, well, but some teams would quit on this, right? Like they would yes. be like, dang dude, like we yeah. stink. Like we're not good right now, but yeah. I have to think that Dabo's is going to get the best out of his team. That's just kind of how my opinion on it. So, yep. To, to your point, Ryan, Notre, this is why I pointed out during the, the previous segment why Notre Dame fans should be able to relate to where Clemson is at right now. Because Notre Dame has been here before. Notre Dame was here last year, like almost this exact spot last season. You know, four and three, you'd lost a, to a bad Stanford team at home. You'd lost to a good but Marshall team that still had no business beating you. You got out thoroughly outplayed in the second half against Ohio State. You're sitting there four and three. Yeah, you beat UNLV, whoop de doo You beat BYU, whoop de doo And you're you're heading to Syracuse. And a lot of Notre Dame fans at the time were like, man, this team, this team stinks. They're going to lose Syracuse. Syracuse is a really good team. I think they were six and one. They took their only loss was to Clemson, and they took Clemson down the wire and, and had a chances to win that game. A lot of Notre Dame fans understandably thought that. That was just not going to – you're going on the road. You're not going to win that game. You're struggling. you know. And then now, remember the conversations at the time. You know, you're looking at your schedule. Boy, they still got to play Clemson. They still got to go to USC. This could get ugly. I, I, There were actually a couple people in, in the, on the message board last year that were talking about, I don't know if Notre Dame's going to make a bowl game looking at the schedule. 
Now, that was the extreme, but the extreme was there because that's how Notre Dame was playing at the time. And what did Notre Dame do? They bounced back. They smashed UNLV. They smashed Syracuse. They they smashed Navy for a while, and then that game, you know, just first got half. Weird first the half, half they smashed, right? and then the second half it was a collapse. Yeah. And then <laughs> they smash they smash um, Boston College, and yep. then just lost to a better USC team. Bounced back and win a big bowl game. And all of a sudden, the team it's three and three, and people are wondering after the Stanford game, somewhat understandably, is this team going to make a bowl game? Right yep. when you look at what was left on their schedule. Now they're nine and four and, and going into the season as a borderline top 10 team. Why? Because they finished strong. This is exactly where Clemson is, right? And this is the whole point is, and they have a coach that we know can rally a team because he's done it. He's had to do it before. And, and so uh, this is a situation where this is, that's why Clemson's dangerous because they do have a talented roster. Is this as talented of a roster as they've had? Guys, we've been saying for two years, this these aren't vintage Clemson teams. We said this about Clemson's team last year when Notre Dame played them. It was a big game. They were number four team in the country, but we 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 were honestly then. This isn't a this isn't 2018 Clemson. This isn't even 2020 Clemson, but it's still a dangerous football team. You've got to come out and play your A game. Notre Dame did, they smacked them. And this is a similar team. If you just think that this is just a four no four and four football team that hasn't beaten anybody good, you'd be right. But you'd also be missing the fact that this team is can can you don't want to be the team that the light goes on right for them. Yeah. You don't want to be that team. And and, and there's still talented sure players different. all over this roster, which we'll highlight the rest of the week. We'll talk about guys like Barrett Miller. We'll talk about guys like Will Shipley if he plays, sure. Phil Moffa. We'll talk about Tyler Davis. We'll talk about Ruka Roro. We'll talk about Nate Wiggins. Like there's a Derek Carter. I mean, yeah. K. Klubnik didn't stop being a talented quarterback. He's just young and making mistakes. The light's going to go on for him someday. You just need to make sure it's not against you. Let's dive into the numbers here, Ryan. This is going to give some, some context as well. The issues that Clemson's having this year. Hold on a second. It's not showing up now. Give me one second. Let me get this up here. Where did it go? I think Where that screen it? froze. There we go. Oh. Okay, now we're back at it. You can see where Clemson's problem is, Ryan. It is very easy to diagnose why Clemson is four and four. There is a lot of not good over here on offense. They rank 64th in the country in points per game. They rank 49th in yards per game, but only 79th in yards per play. Uh, they rank 65th in rushing yards, 98th in tackles for loss allowed. They also rank 65th in sacks allowed because their offensive line has been a problem. They rank 46th in passing yards, but again, they're a volume team, right? Yeah. They get a lot of yards, but low yards per play because they run a lot of plays. They're 93rd in yards per attempt, 121st in yards for completion. I'm sitting there still have I'm still having nightmares about T. Higgins and Justin Ross running by Notre Dame's corners. And I'm now looking at this team and they're 121st in yards per completion. And, and 124th in red zone offense, and they've committed 15 turnovers this season, which is just, I mean, just really unheard of for a team like Clemson. And they've thrown, they've thrown five, they've only thrown five interceptions. They've lost 10 fumbles. And that's that insane. to me is, is symbolic of what this issue is. They're a very just poorly coached football team right now on offense. They just are, they beat themselves a lot. You know, you Zero talk about identity, all their, no identity. Yes, none. At all. You yeah. know, you want to talk about the issues and all those type of things on offense. and But here's the deal. Here's what I know. They went for over 400 yards against Florida State. They've got the ball in the – I think it was the I think it was the fourth quarter. Let me look and see when that – yes, it was the – it was the – it was late in the – it was late in the third quarter. So there was less than a minute left in the third quarter. Clemson's up 24 to 17. I'm going to give you the exact situation because it was a – it was a – to me, it was the it was the turning point of their season, Ryan. Honestly, even even before the field goal, I think this was the turning point of their season. They get the ball back with a minute 31, 41 left in the third quarter. They had just forced a three and out punt, right? They had scored on their previous drive to go up 24-21. Long drive, 11 plays, 77 yards. They were starting to lean on floor, say a little bit, if you remember that drive. Hit a couple yep. nice plays, a couple shots down the field. They force a quick three and out. They get the ball. A minute 41 left in the third quarter. First play. You remember that Phil Moffa goes right up the middle of the left, cuts it back, 
46 yep. yard gain. Two, they're now second and 10 at the Florida State 29 yard line. They bring a safety blitz. Caden Kulbick never sees it. Maffa misses yep. the block, drills Klubnik, ball goes flying up. Kalen Deloach picks it up, runs it back for a touchdown. With 30 seconds left, they tied the game. Clemson I think is it was 29. Akeem Dent, right? Akeem Dent, I think that had the fumble, sack. I believe. I, I think, think so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and Deloach picks it up, runs it back, and Cle- in a potential 31 to 17 game where it's basically over because Florida yeah. State was not going to drive again two times on score on that Clemson defense. Not that day. Especially now that you have to pass because fl- rec- the receivers from Clemson made some big plays. But they had to fight for those yards because Sheridan Jones and Nate Wiggins are good football players and are playing at a high level this year. And they still had R.J. Mickens, who was playing well at the time. He's now out, with which a weird. So you see what happened with him? Mm-hmm. He had an appendectomy yeah. after the uh, after the Miami loss. Okay, he had to get his appendix removed. So that's why he's Ooh. out. Yes, very scary situation. So he won't be playing this weekend. The, the he's, one a of good, he's a good really, safety too. He's he was good, having yeah. a really good year. They had a their safeties as a whole were playing because that's been a weakness for them for years. Yeah, like even going back to the 2018 team, I was like, man, you can take advantage of their safeties. You know, yeah, yeah. Tanner Mew, him, Muse, him, Tanner him Muse, and Kuba are Kayvon pretty good Wallace. now. Yes, yeah. and Jalen Phillips is having a nice year this year as well. Yeah. He's having a solid year this year as well. And then they were starting to do some things with him, M- M- Makuba, where they were moving him around, playing him a little yep. bit of corner in rotation, put him in some slot. And then you can't do that anymore now. So anyway, your Florida State that day was not scoring two more times on Clemson if Clemson goes down and punches it in. And they had all the momentum. And then right. that play happens. But that's that right there at the bottom, it's like that's who Clemson is. I mean, same thing happened against Miami. You know, where, where Klubnik is just kind of running and just psh, ball gets knocked out of his hand. They lost a touchdown because Will Shipley fumbles the ball at the at the goal line. I mean, he's literally about to score and he gets the ball knocked out and and, yep. and Miami recovers the football. So this has been a team that has has been close to making those those moments that they need to turn their season around. And they just make those mistakes that cost them football games. Notre Dame can't allow them to eliminate those mistakes. Right. I mean, you have to be the team that kind of puts that away. And just for for to make a point, Will Shipley fumbles. Miami gets the ball back on the very next play. They run 80 yards for a touchdown. They fumble the ball and their guy recovers it in the end zone. Although I think they ruled that he was already in. I believe if I remember correctly, Ryan, they ruled he was already in, but they recovered yeah. just that's how the ball that's how the ball bounces sometimes, right? And so They've had plenty of chances, Ryan, to to right the ship. So, like you said, they're not just going out there getting their butts kicked every weekend. And what keeps them in games, however, is over here, Ryan. This is a very good defensive football team. The twenty one points a game does not do justice to how good this you, this team. You can is. St- you can stare at the turnovers on the left side and understand why the point per game is so high when they only average yep. to let up two hundred and sixty six yards a game yep. and four point three yards per play. This is a very good defense, yep. folks. A They've lot given of up, talent on this defense. Yep, two pick sixes. They've yep. given up a fumble return for a touchdown. Uh, on the season so they've given up three touchdowns just by the defense alone and to your point the offense has given teams very short fields to get other touchdowns this is pro they're playing more like i mean if you really compare the numbers ryan and i'm gonna i'm gonna do some things here where i'm gonna compare some of the pro football focus disruptive numbers and production numbers and you'll see it's very close to what notre dame is that's that's how well they've played this year they should be more on par with where notre dame is from a a points per game standpoint. If you if you take away the offense just turning the ball over a ton this season. And and so number 6 in yards per game, number 8 in yards per play, 16th yep. in in fewest rushing yards allowed, 16th in in uh yards allowed per rush, they're 12th in tackles for loss, and they're only 54th in sacks. They have generated a lot of negatives in the run game, which has me a little bit concerned about this that matchup, which I'll talk about tomorrow. They rank ninth in fewest passing yards allowed, sixth in y- lowest yards per attempt, ninth in lowest yards per completion, twelfth in quarterback rating. They're good, not great on the third on third down and in the red zone. You know, they're they're top forty in both, not elite, but they're they're good in both. This is a very good defense, and this is the side of the ball that concerns me because the Notre Dame offense. I don't know who they are yet. Yes, they've had a couple nice bounce back games, but they've had a lot. They've got a lot to prove. 
they've got to show, and that's something when you look at this matchup, Brian, the offense, the, we're, we're talking about what we're going to learn about Notre Dame. Yeah. This is a big, we're going to learn a lot about the Notre Dame offense this week. Because you may be playing a four and four football team, but you're playing a top ten defense. Yep, F- fact. No, to me, it's not even debatable. You're playing a top yep. ten defense, and well, so you've got to go out and yep, you got to go out. And I was prove just going to say team. there's there's NFL players and there's all Americans everywhere, potential mm-hmm. Americans on Clemson everywhere. I mean, I uh, in my matchup article that'll be coming out, like I talked a lot about Notre Dame's interior offensive line is still one that we have questions about, right? As far as mm-hmm. what the consistency level can be, can they? be the Ohio state version on a week to week basis. Are they somewhere in between? Are they the Tennessee state version or the, you know, Louisville version or the Duke Mm -hmm. version? Like which version is this offensive line on the interior? And this is the game where if you could ever be that Ohio state version again, this is the game to do it, right? Because you're facing off against Tyler Davis, Rukuro, Roro, both kids are going to be NFL players. The Peter Woods kid, the true freshman's been playing, mm-hmm. and he's going to be a very good football player as he continues to develop and gain more experience. They have a lot of, especially yep. interior defensive linemen. TJ Parker is another like, freshman who's a dude yes, for them. So, uh, I mean, really good. Yeah, but, yeah, he is a really dude. Good. Yes, Ryan. And if you get, and if you get NFL and, guys, well, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, if you get beat up by that interior defensive line or that defensive line in general as well, it's going to allow Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter to just run free, which yep. that's not what you want to do. Those kids are both undersized, and you could take advantage of them in certain situations, but if they're running free because your defensive line is playing really in, well in front of them, then they're going to make a lot of plays. And then, I mean, secondary-wise, I mean, we were just texting about it earlier, Brian. Nate Wiggins might be the best corner that you're going to see all year. Yeah. All due respect to yeah. Denzel Burke. Nate Wiggins is that guy, a, in my opinion. As a He's cover a guy. As yeah. a cover guy. I would argue that Denzel Burke is a much more effective tackler and run defense, run screen defender. I think you could make the same case about the two kids at Duke. But because and you'd mentioned this to me, Ryan, too, when we were texting. You're like, look, run at that kid, run at him, yes. make him tackle, make Dreams. him you know, because he's yeah. a very skinny kid. He's not yeah. like Cam Hart, where he's thin but strong. He's a very skinny yeah. kid. He wants to go out there and cover all day. He and is the really best cover <laughs> corner that Notre Dame will face this year, in my opinion. I don't think there's a better one. All around corner, maybe we could have a conversation, but right now I'm more concerned about Notre Dame making plays in the pass game. And Sheridan Jones has been pretty good, uh, much better this year. I mean, this was an area that the last couple of years, Ryan, was a major weakness, corner and safety. And the safeties have gotten a lot better. And the the corners have gotten a lot better. The corners always had talent, Ryan. They just would give up yeah. plays. You're like, what are you doing, right? Like, you're not playing to your potential. This year, they are. And, you know, so – so, but if 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 Toriano Pride plays, basically every time he's in the game, they don't even say, okay, go at him, right? Sam Hartman – destroyed that kid last year and then he comes in against nc state they throw a slant on him he misses the tackle and the guy runs 72 yards for a touchdown right i mean go at him but the two starting corners are dudes they are absolute dudes so this is going to be a huge test if notre dame's offense plays well in this game there will be some that might dismiss it because oh they're four and five that's fine as a team that's fine this is in my opinion the second best all around defense that they're going to face this season, in my view. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say behind Ohio State. I think Ohio sure. State's defense as a whole is is better than than Duke simply because their linebackers are much better. Secondaries yeah. are very close. D lines, very close. They're different, very close in production. Uh to me, it Ohio State's balance at all four spots, safety corner, linebacker, D line is why they're my number one for me. Duke is the most physical defense that Notre Dame played this year I would argue Clemson is the second best now where are they going to be mental and as from a mental space standpoint after the last couple games we're gonna find out but they didn't lose this last game because the defense guys they only gave up they only gave up I'm looking at it here the NC State offense only had 202 yards of offense against Clemson and they 72 of them came on one play you know you know what I mean like enough they had 24 points seven of them came on a 72 yard catch and run it was a slant route Guy misses a tackle when he runs. And then another touchdown was on Peyton Wilson picking a pass off. That was a sick play, by the way. He made that look way easier than it should have been. And then shows off his freaky athleticism, runs it back for a touchdown. I mean, 
Yeah. Defense was dominant outside of one play. Uh, you know, so so this defense is going to be ready to play, Ryan. And that's my concern is that the def- the, the, the the Notre Dame offense struggles against this defense to the point where Clemson can break one in the fourth quarter for a score and win the game. That's the fear. Right. That's that's the upset fear for me is that mm-hmm. matchup. But if the offense can come out to play, yes, it helps you win. But B, it, it's it's sign it's a sign to us. Well, it is to me, Ryan. And, and you can you can tell me if you agree. It's a sign to me that this offense has truly turned a corner. And this is the last chance to prove that this season. Like for Jared Parker, this is a huge game. This is his last chance to show I can go do what we did against Pitt and Central yeah. Michigan and Navy against a really good defense, which I don't know that he's done. I, I'd say he, yeah, he's done once against NC State, but the next three good defenses they played, he didn't didn't do well. This is going to be one of the best he's going to face. And, and you can't just take the game plan from last year against Clemson and think that it's going to work this year because I don't think it's going to. I mean, last year, it didn't make any sense why Notre Dame was – so easily able to run the football against that Clemson team last year. It literally didn't make any sense. They were only through for about 90 yards in that football game, and they came out from start and finish and just ran down Clemson's throat. And it didn't make any sense because that was a good run-stopping team, and Notre Dame's was just from start to finish, was able to run it down their throat and block them up and was able to dominate that football game. Notre Dame can't do that in this game, in my opinion. Notre Dame is going to have to come out and have much more of a balanced attack and have much more of an ability to create some plays in the passing game. And as you see by these numbers, folks, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do to create pass to create chunk plays in the passing game against this team, but you cannot come out and just be the same ball control, run the ball down your throat team that you saw last year, because you know what Clemson's going to do, Brian, they're going to look at that game last year and be like, that's not going to happen again. Like, are you crazy? We're not, we're, we are going to put more into stopping the run this year than we were last year. We're going to dare you to throw the football on us. And Notre Dame's going to have to create a couple plays in this football game from a passing game perspective. When, and and we'll dive a lot more into this in the keys to victory, Ryan, but the reason this is a tough matchup for Notre Dame is because Clemson has the corners to be able to just say, we're just going to line up and go man and just play you one-on-one. And dare you to beat us with Jaden Thomas and Jaden Greathouse and Tobias Merriweather because we don't think you can. And nobody has yet. Nobody's been able to make those kind of plays on the outside. They're going to load the box because they are not going to want to let happen what happened to them last year. They're they're not. Now, they don't have the same horses they had last year either. Let's be honest. They don't have Miles Murphy. That's a loss. They don't have Brian Bercy. That's a loss. But they're still really good. And Notre Dame's guards are not right now playing really well and and yeah. Zeke curl has been very up and down and I think part of that is because of the guards and we talked about this when the center's getting used to bit with guards around him and he doesn't maybe trust the guard play that can really have an impact on the center especially a guy like Zeke who's not you know a massive guy or an elite athlete can just get away with certain things that, that some of the really really elite talents can so it's it's going to be a battle. You're going to have to earn it. You're going to have to play at a high level, and you're going to need a good game plan because this is a really, really good defense. And I, like I said, yep. I would argue this is the second-best defense you're going to play all year behind Ohio State. And Ohio State has proven since that game that they're an elite defense. I mean, they've, they've shown themselves to be that. They're an elite defense. And Clemson is also an elite defense. They're just unfortunately playing with a really bad offense. Yes. <laughs> really bad offense. 28 points a game. You you went out and got the biggest name on the offensive coordinator offensive coordinator list this offseason. You brought him in to run your system that was already in place and you're curious on why you have not been a very good offensive team. I'm yeah. shocked. I'm shocked that that's happened. Yeah. But Yep. Ryan, I want to compare some stats for the Notre Dame defense versus the Clemson defense just to kind of give yeah. some context on how good Clemson has been this year. This is from Pro Football Focus. This is data collection, so we're looking at it this way, Ryan. Uh, Pressures per game, Notre Dame averages 20. Clemson averages 18.5. Hits on the quarterback per game, Notre Dame's at 4. Clemson's at 3.1. Sacks on the quarterback per game, Notre Dame's at 2.7. Clemson's at 2.9. Run stops per game, which is basically wins for the defense. 
26.1 for both teams. I, I, and the reason I'm doing per game is because Notre Dame's played one more game than Clemson. So I started giving you like raw data. It would be very skewed in Notre Dame's favor. So I'm giving you the per play averages. Notre Dame is allowing opponents to complete 57.5% of their passes on the season. That's according to pro football focus. Again, because what they do is they remove, uh, they, they get their completion percentage by removing things like throwaways, uh, batted balls, things that aren't actual complete like uh, when i say completed passes i mean passes that reach their conclusion essentially or right. have a target it in gets mind to the receiver yeah correct right. correct whether yeah. it's incomplete picked off whatever so batted balls get taken out throwaways get taken out so 57.5 is actually a pretty decent number notre dame's at 51.4 i think on the season overall when you include all those type of things uh Cle- clemson's at 61.7 so notre dame has the advantage there Notre Dame is allowing 6.2 yards per target. Clemson's only allowing 6.0 yards per target. Notre Dame is allowing 10.9 yards per catch. Clemson's allowing 9.8 yards per catch. Notre Dame has has 33 passes defensed, which is 33.7 per game. Clemson has 26, which is 3.3 per game, because, again, they've played one less game. Here's some interesting numbers, too, Ryan. We, We talk about how often Clemson likes to blitz. This season, Notre Dame has brought pressures from its linebackers 245 times. Now, that's not 245 snaps because some of them are your linebackers coming twice. That is an average of, for Notre Dame, 27.2 pressures per game from the linebackers. Now, uh, rushes per game, not pressures, pass rushes per game. So times that they were used to rush the quarterback. Some of those are going to be third down. Clemson, who also likes to bring their linebackers, only has 163. Uh, blitzes from their linebackers, Ryan, which is only t- which is twenty point four uh, on the season. So Notre Dame is about seven more per game. Now here's another difference: Notre Dame on the season has brought thirty one cornerback pressures and nineteen safety pressures, which is good for five point six per game. Clemson has brought twenty five corner pressure corner fires and twenty safety blitzes, which is good for five point six per game. So they both bring this DBs a lot on pressures and and so that number is about the same so it just shows how often notre dame brings break trigger somebody in, in in the past game but clemson also still does it a lot and so then they have two common opponents brian as we continue to kind of give you some data on clemson uh the duke offense scored 14 points against notre dame had 323 yards 4.8 yards per play they scored 28 points against clemson 374 yards and 5.8 yards per play. The Duke, D, the, the NC State offense against Notre Dame had 24 points and had 344 yards of offense, but also only 4.4 for, per play, which is relevant because Duke or NC State scored 17 offensive points against Clemson and had 202 yards in the game, which is 142 more or fewer than they had against Notre Dame. But they were 4.4 per play. So the yards per play was the same. They just ran fewer plays. And then defensively, Notre Dame held Duke to 300 and, uh, no, excuse me, Notre Dame's offense went for 381 yards against Duke and 6.1 yards per play. Clemson had more yards, Ryan, at 422, which is, what would that be, about 41 more? But they were only 5.1 yards per play. So Notre Dame had more big plays in the game. They went for a whole yard better yards per play. Against NC State, Clemson's offense uh, had 364 yards, went for 4.5 yards per play. The Notre Dame offense went for 456 yards and 7.5 yards per play because Notre Dame ripped off a lot of big plays in that game. So that is the how they've done against each other. Both defenses played really well in both games. Notre Dame's offense has, has outperformed Clemson in those two games. Now you need to make sure that you do it again because that's what this game comes down to for me, Ryan. When you when you break it down, it's two great defenses against two eh, not sure what you are on offense. The difference is, is Notre Dame has flash has flashes have been really good. Clemson just hasn't been good all year outside of what Florida Atlantic and Charleston Southern. I mean, their offense has just kind of struggled all year where Notre Dame is like, can you guys please give me the Navy game, the Tennessee State game? Can you give me the the NC State game even? Can you give me the – like if Notre Dame replicates against Clemson what they did against NC State, they win this game by 20 because they'll rip off some big plays and and, and put Clemson behind. Because if Clemson's offense gets behind the eight ball, 
and Notre Dame can kind of just pin your ears back and attack the, the quarterback, that's when they'll blow them out because they'll force a couple turnovers and and really run them off the field. Uh, but if you can't do that, then it's going to be much more. Can you give me the can you give me the pit offense? Can you give me the the heck? I'll even take the Ohio State offense if you just are a little bit better on about four plays. You know, just con- convert some of those fourth downs. Uh, so whereas Clemson or uh, with uh, Clemson, it's kind of like yeah, they haven't really shown that they can be that. And that's to me why ultimately I'm going to pick Notre Dame is because I think they have the better offense of the two. And, and, and um, you know, I think they just have a lot more things going for them. But this is what makes this matchup concerning for me is because this Notre Dame team has been in dogfights against teams with comparable defenses to Clemson. Now, what Clemson doesn't have is Louisville's offense. Right. But they have enough talent, Ryan, where if the Notre Dame defense has an off day, they can look like that. And that's that's ultimately the concern that I have in this matchup. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would echo the same sentiment. I think that for me, I'm not worried about the Notre Dame defense versus the Clemson offense. I'm worried about can the Notre Dame offense give you enough against a really good Clemson defense to put you in a position where you win this football game and maybe even win it convincingly. Like I think that it's on the table, but I think that that matchup of Notre Dame offense versus the defense is – going to be the big determiner of just what this football game looks like. If you play poor on offense, you're literally Clemson is going to have a chance to win the football game. If you play solid on offense, you might win the football game. If you play really good on offense, you might end up winning convincingly against the University of Clemson this week. I mean, so I, I think that Notre Dame's offense versus Clemson's defense is going to be the make it or break for this game. I would agree. Yeah. This is, this is, I mean, I just, it, I'm going to circle it back to the big picture stuff we were talking about earlier, Ryan. Yep. And for the offense, especially there's a bigger picture aspect to this game. There is for the defense. It's just keep doing what you're doing. Right. I mean, that's, do you disagree defensively? Just keep doing what you're doing. Yep. Offensively, you got a lot to prove because if you struggle in this game, no one's going to care what you did against Pitt last week. No one's going to care what you did against USC. They're not going to care what you did against NC state or, Navy or Tennessee State or Central Michigan. They're going to say, whenever you play good defense, you struggle to score points. And that's true. And that's yep. factual. Uh, the NC State game right now is the anomaly for Notre Dame. Sure. You do well against Duke. You can say, look, guys, we had a we had a couple rough weeks. Duke and Louisville were bad. Ohio State, we actually, I think they actually played well. They just didn't finish. Yeah, you know, they kept moving the ball into Ohio State territory. They just couldn't finish. That's got to get better, but that's not a bad performance. That's a not good enough performance. That There's a difference between the two. Yep. Duke and Louisville were bad. You come out and play well against Clemson, and now it's like, no, you're actually a pretty good offense. You just got to figure out how to do better in those couple games. And that's, 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 that's what we said about Al Golden last year. So big picture offensively, this is a huge, huge game for this offense, for this offensive coaching staff, in my opinion. It really, really is. Yep. I, like Again, I think it's going to make it or break it. I mean, that's kind of how I would phrase it. Notre Dame has to have a really good offensive game plan, and they have to be ready for the challenge, right? Because Clemson's going to pressure. Clemson's going to be aggressive. I mean, it, it's a much more pressure-oriented team than it was last season, for instance, in the first year after the transition from Brent Venables, and I think that they are going to lean on their ability to pressure quarterbacks and to get in the backfield and create negatives because they have the corners this year more than last that they can or uh, secondary just in general, even Andrew Bakuba coming up and playing some man-to-man coverage, like they can do those things and they can take games away, or they can force teams to be uncomfortable and they can create pressures for themselves, so I think that that is the key matchup and that will show obvious growth because if you can move the ball against Clemson and have a very good performance offensively against Clemson, you can do it against pretty much any team in college football. I mean, they are one of the best defenses in college football. There is no doubt about it. Just quickly, Ryan, before we, we wrap up this Clemson overview, I would say offensively, there's not a whole lot different to what they've been in the past. There's some there's some schematic things that are unique to, that that Garrett Riley has brought with him, but structurally, tempo wise, pace wise, how they attack defenses, it's pretty much what they've always been. And 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 I'm say what I say, and then you can add to it, disagree, whatever. 
Defensively, I would say that they're a little bit more aggressive this year than they were last year. Yeah, uh, they're a little bit more multiple this year than they were last year. They don't just line up and say we're better than you like they did last year. Uh, they try to create mistakes more than they did last year. So I think the D coordinator's grown a little bit this season. What Wes Goodwin is has has so that right there tells me they're not just going to line up on what they did what they did last year because that's not who they are anymore. Like they just thought yeah. they could line up and do what they do. Well, them doing what they do against Notre Dame this year is going to look different than it did last year. So what's ironic is we've actually seen more evolving from the defensive staff this season than we've seen on offense, even though the defense has not been the problem the last couple right. of years. And and so and, and whoever their secondary coach is, I, I'm going to look it up here real quick. I don't know who their who their uh, secondary coach is, but I, I'll tell you what, man, he has done a really good job of of getting this group to play better and maybe it's two different secondary coaches i'm going to actually look that up now they have a safeties coach so the code d coordinator mickey cone is a is their safeties coach and then mike reed who's their special teams coordinator is their cornerbacks coach those two guys have done a phenomenal job of getting growth from this secondary because it's the same kids they had last year ryan same kids that struggled last year to stop the pass the same kids that Sam Hartman torched last season. Yep. And had it not been a 40-mile-an-hour wins, I think Notre Dame would have thrown on them too. I really thought Notre Dame was going to throw on that football team, but when it was 40-mile-an-hour wins, you're like, I'm not having Drew Pine throwing this. But uh, that group has has done a complete 180. And now, Ryan, I think this is one of the top 10 secondaries in college football right now. From what I've seen on film, because their safeties are playing well. Their safeties aren't elite players, Ryan. They're just – all they just do their job really well you know yeah. it's like they're athletic versions of dj brown if that makes sense meaning like they don't get the tr they don't have the problems that dj has because they're better athletes but they just they just do their job their corners especially nate, nate wiggins are really good so i don't know that there's a i mean you, you tell me if i'm if i'm wrong here nfl draft guy i don't see yeah. an aj terrell in this secondary uh, I, I don't even nate really wiggins see like, Nate, like top top 20 pick, you think he can be that guy? I, I would I wouldn't be surprised if Nate Wiggins is the first corner selected in the 2024 NFL draft. I you think he's on the top 20? That. Yeah, I think okay. I just am yeah. concerned because the size and physicality. I don't see that like AJ Terrell had. I think he's so, pretty physical in coverage, though. Just in, in the run yeah. game, I agree, though. He so struggles. They have run. him. I don't see Sher Sheridan Jones being Trayvon Mullen. I don't see that from him. Uh, just as far as, as a – I don't know about draft. I'll take your word for that. In college, I don't think Nate Wiggins is as good as A.J. Terrell was in 2018, just my opinion. But he's really good. We're splitting mm -hmm. hairs. Sheridan Jones is a solid – he's not Trayvon Mullen, in my yeah. opinion. But the safety position is a lot better than what it was in 2018, in my opinion. You had Tanner Muse yeah. and Kayvon Wallace. These yeah. guys are much better players, in my view. And that's and what I, makes this secondary a really good group, in my view. Right. And I think I think Makuba can end up going top 150-ish type of player. Like, if he goes third or fourth rounds, when if he declares this year or next year, I think he has that type of talent. So, yeah. It's a talented secondary. It really yeah. is. Now, and not having a... R.J. Mickens hurts them a little bit, though, because it yeah. takes away some of their ability to move Makuba around. But they mm -hmm. still were really good. I mean, last week, what did NC State have? NC State last week threw Ryan for – 200 and no let me see here it's nc state they had um was it 260 or uh let me look it up here real quick because i have lost that so let me see here hold on let me see what nc state did last week against against clemson but 72 again 72 of it came on one play so last week there it is they had 138 passing yards last week against clemson ryan yeah, NC State did. Seventy-two of it came on one play. Was was it Concepcion? Concepcion. This, it was. They ran like a little slant route against Toriano Pride. Pride yeah. missed him, and he just. That kid's might have been a, nice a quick year, post. Man. Yeah, he yeah. has. He has. But that that was it. So again, this is a really good defense. If Clemson had any kind of offense, Ryan, this is at, at worst a six and two football team. At worst. Yep. Yep. And that's the I thing agree. that I'm trying to, to make clear to people because if the Notre Dame offense plays well, they're got to do it against a really good defense. If the receivers play well, it's against a really good secondary. If they don't play well, it becomes a problem because now you're basically saying we can't play well against good defenses. 
So a lot at stake for them this weekend. But I, I do like the talent. But I, I really – I feel like they're doing more man outside this year than last year, Ryan. It could just be because they're better at it. I'm noticing it more. But I yeah. feel like they're doing less zone than they did last year. The weakness for them in the past game, Ryan, and, and, and you you said it before, you and I were talking about before the show, but there is one weak spot if Notre Dame can exploit the pass game, could be something that uh, is a big benefit in this game. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it. I think isolating the middle of the field is an opportunity for Notre Dame. I mean, I I really think that the running backs could be a part of this passing game this week. I think that the tight ends could be a big part. I think that the slot receivers, whether that is Chris Tyree or you throw Jaden Thomas in there at times or it's Jordan Faison or you throw Jaden Greathouse in there at times, I really think the middle of the field is vulnerable, especially in man coverage, because I look, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is a really good college linebacker. I don't think I think he's pretty overrated, to be honest, especially on an NFL draft side of things. I think he's very overrated, but he is a really good tackle to tackle inside linebacker, a guy that's going to come downhill, a guy that's going to be consistent in the run game, run fills, that type of gambit. He's a but throwback. When you get, I mean, he, yeah, he really he, is. He's his dad. I mean, I mean, yeah. he's a smaller yeah. version of his dad, but his dad was yeah. the same dude. The axe man was tackle to tackle thumper. But Jeremiah Trotter Jr., if you can get him in space and get him isolated, you can make plays against him. You can do it against their linebackers and their second-level defenders just in general. You mentioned that one of their better safeties is also out with an injury as of right now as well. So there is middle-of-the-field opportunities to take advantage of. So trying to get them isolated. Uh, Someone, we talked about it before the show, and like, I wouldn't hate it if you're in some type of formation where you motion Chris Tyree into the backfield and you try to isolate him against a linebacker at some point in this game because you're going to run a lot of man and there's going to be opportunities there, whether it's a wheel or it's an angle route or an option route or whatever, you can take advantage of the second level. And I think that's where you need to find it. The middle of the field should be there. You're going to need to make a couple plays outside as you always do. But I really think that Notre Dame is going to have a chance to win at the middle of the field because I think they have advantages on the second level athletically. Agree. Agree. I also think it's a game where you could see you need to see a Jeremiah Love, Jadarian Price, ISOs against the linebackers. Because one of two reasons, Ryan. Number one is if you get Trotter in one on one or in any kind of chase situation, that's a that's an advantage. I mean, Florida State did that. They ran just a little little quick slide to Trey Benson and just said, "Hey, Trey, you got to outrun Jeremiah Trotter to the sideline," and that's exactly what he did for like a twenty nine yard gain. But also, if you have something designed to attack the backers and you catch them in a blitz, again they 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 average twenty pressures t- pressures a game with their line by pressures, meaning they're going to bring them on a pass game pressure, twenty a game. If you have something designed to be in isolation against Barrett Carter and he's coming, somebody could be coming open, right? Now it's up to Sam Hartman to get the ball out and, you know, all those type of things, but that's where you can generate some big plays. That's where Notre Dame has a chance to do some big things in this game. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So that's going to do it for the breakdown of Clemson. We obviously talked about the big picture nature of this game and again, I, I know some of you are obsessed with, oh, Clemson's not good. You can keep telling yourself that, and that's that's factual because they're 4-4. Four and four. Our contention is it is a dangerous football team. And if Notre Dame is going to continue growing and developing as a program, they need to handle their business this weekend. But they're going to need to play well to do it. You don't just roll the balls out and Clemson lays down and dies because they're you're way better than them. They've been in every game that they've lost so far. And they're going, this is their season is on the line, and they're going to play like a team with their backs against the wall. So, Notre Dame's going to have to bring it this weekend. If they do, they'll win. If they don't, they got a shot to lose. And that's what's at stake this weekend. And so, you know, we're going to find out. We're going to find out what Notre Dame is able to do. Broke down the big picture nature of it as well. Just a reminder to, to, to as well, before we dive into the mailbag tonight at nine o'clock p.m. We will be going live on CFB Nation. Myself, Bill Bender, Bill Trochu will be going live on CFB Nation at 9 o'clock to break down the first batch of the college football playoff rankings. So if you have not done so, please subscribe on the YouTube channel to CFB Nation. I will also tweet it out. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that as well. We're going to go live about 9 o'clock to break down the first batch of college football playoff rankings. So that's going to do it for this part of the show. Got a mailbag coming up next. So we don't have a whole lot of mailbag questions yet, so it will likely be a quick one. 
So if you do have some mailbag questions, go ahead and get those thrown in there now. Uh, but before we do, hit that like button, folks. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. We would greatly appreciate a five-star review if you're listening via podcast platform. And if you've not already done so, please sign up for the message board at boards.rsbreakdown.com. If we had as many message board members as we have people that listen to the show on a regular basis, we would be able to make some moves from a staff standpoint that you guys, I think, would really like. So uh, if, you, if you haven't already done so, sign up for the message boards. If you are a member and you want to support us even above and beyond the membership price, you can sign up for either the 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 uh, Shamrock, Blue, or Gold Club, which comes with some free IB merch. So you'll definitely check that out as well. So for Brian, I'm Ryan. Thanks for watching this portion of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. So, Ryan, it is mailbag time. You came back just in time, man. So we got some questions. Yeah. We don't have a lot right now. We'll see if some get added. Uh, but uh, let's let's dive into this, this mailbag. Let's do it. Ready to go. Irish blooded with a question to kick us off. Who would you say is Clemson's best win so far? Syracuse or Wake Forest? I'd say Syracuse oh, for two reasons. Yeah. I mean, they're both four and four, right? Neither right. of them are very good. Uh, Syracuse was on the road. So that's part of it for me. And then it was a much more convincing win. Like when sure. I when you watch the yeah. Wake Forest game, it was it was kind of an ugly win, right? It just was like, eh, it's just an ugly win. Those two teams haven't played each other, and and you know, Syracuse is not playing well now. They're both four and four and all that type of stuff. I think I think Wake Forest has been a, little, a more competitive team in their losses than than Syracuse. When Syracuse loses, they tend to lose big. Uh, yeah. But it, you went on the road and you beat them convincingly. You know, and, and you you played well. You, you, your offense didn't play great, but they did what they needed to do. They didn't turn it over a bunch, hit a couple big plays. When when Syracuse made that really big mistake at the end of the first half, I think it was 14-7, to seven, and they decided to go for it on fourth down at midfield, the Clemson offense. And I think one of Clemson's two scores at the time, Ryan, was like a, a very short drive because you recovered a fumble. And, 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 and uh, Coach Babers decided to go for it, and it definitely didn't work out. And Clemson went right down the field and scored. So their offense did what they needed to do. And in and, and they were actually down 14 to seven, if you remember, at one point, Ryan. And yep. they were able to kind of come out and and um kind of turned it into a, a much bigger lead. So yeah. I, yeah, I think just for the simple final score of 31-14, that would edge it out for me. Cause like you said, the Wake Forest game was a was an ugly affair. I actually yeah. kind of like a couple of the players on the Wake Forest defense, which, you know what I mean? But, like, yeah. I mean, both teams aren't very good. So, right. if we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, it, the, the final result is what I would work with there. I said that they went for a fourth down. They went for a long field goal on fourth down. It's like a 57-yard field goal. And then that gave them great field position. So, that's that. That's what happened. And then Clemson went right down and scored. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, if I were to if I were to make a prediction today on who would win in the in the matchup against Wake Forest and Syracuse, because they actually play each other at the end of the year. Last game of the season, they yeah. play at Syracuse. If I was making a prediction right now, I'd say if if Wake Forest has their starting quarterback back, I'd pick Wake Forest to win that game. I, I would. Probably. But as far as best win on the road, more convincing, that's their best win to me. Neither yeah. of them are very good. And the fact that Clemson is is we're having this conversation is, is is not a good sign. And you need to make sure as Notre Dame that they don't then say that the, the answer to that question a week from now isn't Notre Dame. That's what they need. Cause to it, do. cause it would easily be Notre Dame. <laughs> there would be no conversation. Anymore. And it won't yeah. change the rest of the year. I mean, it'll be that right. way the rest of the year with all due respect to North Carolina. Connor Patton with the super chat. Thank you so much. Connor. He says, if I'm Clemson, I'm sick of turning the ball over and I want to, it, nothing else stop the turnovers. Could this be worked into a Notre Dame strategy? Well, so are, are we, are, are we saying that the offense for Clemson gets a little bit more like passive and you're just kind of ball control uh, and you don't want to make mistakes? Like, is that what we're kind of I saying could, here? I guess I could see that Ryan. I could, I mean, if I'm Clemson right now, I'm going to say, I'm going to force Notre Dame's offense to, to, to beat us. I'm, I'm going to make, I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust our defense not to put them. And this is a mistake that I think coach Sweeney has made this year. I think at times he, his trust of his defense has been, let's go for it on fourth down or let's take a chance here. And then it doesn't work out as opposed to, Hey, we're not very good on offense. So how about we, I don't know, let's punt it here and make that team go X a number of yards and, right. and score on our defense, which just most teams aren't, capable of doing 
And and so I could see them employing that strategy. I could certainly see that. I could certainly see yeah. that. And it would it would make sense to do so. Now, right. can Notre Dame can that work into Notre Dame's strategy? If Clemson is coming out playing conservative, if I'm Notre Dame, I would do the exact opposite. Take chances. Because their off your offense matches up better against their defense than the other way around, in my opinion. Right. Right. And so if you can jump ahead of their offense, Ryan, and get them out of that, then that's advantage Notre Dame. Because if, if this comes down to Cade Klubman's got to put this team on his shoulders and he's going to do some things that you've got to be worried about. He's a very good runner. He's a very good athlete. But you can force him into mistakes if you can get him moving. If you can get him uncomfortable in a pocket, he will make mistakes. Flat out will make mistakes. And, and so if you allow him to play into this strategy – then you have that. So offensively, I want to see Notre Dame take some chances. Defensively, Ryan, that means you've got to create some big negatives and early downs, and you've got to limit big plays. Because if Clemson employs that strategy, then they're going to say, hey, we're going to run the ball. We're going to try to establish line of scrimmage. We're going to run the perimeter quick game and try and suck you down. And what does Clemson do when the defense starts to suck down? Even a conservative Clemson team is going to take a shot down the field, right? And so you've got to be able to make some plays in those situations. And if they're able to do that, then um, they're going to have success against Notre Dame. If not, yeah. then Notre Dame will perform well. Well, I, th I think the problems with turnovers for Clemson is not necessarily as a passing offense in the sense of quarterback throwing to wide receivers because we haven't seen a ton of interceptions where they have five on the season. It's just like five stupid fumbles, man, like in the pocket, and running backs fumbles. fumbling. Like it's just – it's been ugly. So, like that version of you, you like Clemson needs to figure that out, right? Because mm -hmm. again, I'm I'm gonna take a interception or two occasionally if my if my if my quarterback is taking some chances. I'm gonna take that. But the fumbles are just stupid, man. Like they yeah. just it, in the worst times of the football game as well. It seems to be this year for Clemson. So that's something they definitely have to figure out. Whether that's extra ball security drills over the these last couple of weeks, whether that is an attention to detail thing. I mean, whatever it is, you need to figure that part out because that is just shooting yourselves in the foot. There's no doubt about that. I will say this, Ryan. You are correct. They don't throw a lot of interceptions, but their interceptions seem to be damaging. And Duke has thrown five picks on the year. Those picks have come in four different games. In those four games, they're one and three, the exception being Charleston Southern. They threw a pick against Duke, a pick against – Miami and two picks against NC State. And they were because when he makes those mistakes, they tend to be like the turnover he had against Notre Dame last year in yeah. bad moments and bad situations. It's the bad turnovers, not the volume per se, but the boy, that couldn't have come at, the, at a worse time. But you couple that with the fumbles and he turns it over a lot. He just doesn't throw a lot of picks to your point. You you said it correctly. Right. But you you got the lost fumble against Miami that that took killed a drive. You got the fumble against Florida State that allowed Florida State to return it for a touchdown. It's those things that this team does. Fumbling at the goal line against Miami that wipes out a touchdown. It, it's it's not only do they turn it over a lot, Ryan, but they turn it over in the worst possible scenarios that almost always result in points, either short fields for the other team or take points off the board for you. And boy, you just you can't allow that to happen. Like what Notre Dame did early against Pitt last week. Like my, they make a, they do that regularly at Clemson. Just yeah, put a drive together and turn it over, and that's what gets them in a lot of trouble. Yeah, a super sticker from Raymond Hart, and thank you, Raymond, very, Thanks, Raymond. very, very much. We had a question from Colmy Tyus: Is predict the three starting linebackers if the current three were to leave? Does Jalen Sneed sneak in? Oh, I'd I'd be surprised if he's not. And I mean, he'll have a great shot at it because he'll be a veteran. But yeah, I I would wonder where. Like, right. is he a rover? Is he a will? I mean, right now he's kind of playing he's will. Just, I know he's listed as the number yeah. two rover, but I've yet to see him play a snap at rover this season, right? Well, it's either been will, will or was, pass yeah. rusher. Would they, would they put Jay Nosbury at rover? Because I feel like he's been playing Possibly. will now too, right? I mean, like, uh, it's kind of been yeah. a little weird. Now, he, he did play positions. some rover in the spring. So yes. he's played it, but yes, in games we've seen him play, he's played inside. So I just yeah. think they're kind of moving away from that a little bit, which, you know, I'm curious how they're going to, how they're going to handle that. But I, I Jalen Snead, Jay Nalls were the two best options. I mean, you're going to have a battle at Mike between Drake Bowen and Nolan Ziegler. And I think you're going to have a battle at will between Jalen Snead and Jay Nallsbury. That's what I think we'll see. 
And you don't think Z- Ziggler will get a chance at the Will spot next year? Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. But I think he's going to get a shot at Mike. I mean, you could see a situation, Ryan, where they're like, dude, our two best linebackers are our two Mikes. Yeah. I could see that. Could certainly see yeah. that. And that's the thing that Notre Dame has said to all these kids, just a little, you know, behind the scenes, is they've said, hey, look, where you're playing now is not, you're not locked into that. They've told these kids, right. if, if you, if you are one of our two best linebackers, this is why they cross train. And again, I, I don't think they should cross train as much when they're freshmen, but then after the freshman year, I'm all for it. Let them learn something first, right? Get good at something first. But the whole point of cross training and why it's good to do eventually is because you don't get in situations where you've got your two best linebackers or mics, and then you got to move one of them, but you're like, but this kid's never played Will before. Right. These kids are getting work at those. So if your two best linebackers are Jaden Osbury and Jalen Sneed, you can move Jalen Osbury into Mike, which they've put him at Mike at times. If your two best linebackers are Drake Bone and Nolan Ziegler, then you move one of them out to Will, and you let him play Will. I'd be curious who they would do that with, because if you've seen Nolan Ziegler in the last couple of games, he's gotten yeah. huge. He's a big kid, like yeah. he is yep. big, yep. and and you know, but I could see Drake filling out like that next year too, with a year in the Drake's pretty room. big for a freshman, you know? man. Yeah, so, yeah, he's big. So too. I I think it'll be some sort of combination of those four. Now, what's the what's the who's the wild card? There's this cat out in California named Kingston Villiama Asa who may, as I think he's yeah. going to be an early enrollee, Ryan. I believe he, he, he could have a say in the conversation as well. Yes. But yeah, he's and also then 230 now, pounds and ready to play. So right yeah. now, who's your rover? That's the that's a different question. That's an, an, a more interesting question. I yeah. personally, of all the guys in the conversation, I, I would I would probably lean towards Jaden Osbury because I think he's the most natural in coverage. But Jalen Seed has the best physical skill set for it. But with Jalen Seed, it's kind of like, do I really want to get him that far away from the football? That's my right. if Jalen Seed's a starting linebacker for me, I want him closer to the ball. That's just you know, because you put him at Rover half the time, he's not going to be on the field. Now you're cross training right. him. He's the one kid I would not cross train right now. He has to learn to be good at one. You know, he's already cross because he's already kind of cross training already, Ryan. He's already playing Will and fight kind of at the edge rusher. Now you yeah. want him playing Rover and Will. I don't know if I'd put that much on his sh- shoulders, but we'll see. I mean, it's it's going to yeah. be an interesting battle for sure. I agree that those are the four guys, though, that you need to keep close eyes on for sure. I'm also interested to see what second year Preston Zinter, what kind of bump he takes this offseason as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, where I'm most curious to see the jump that Nolan, that Preston Zinter takes, it's not even necessarily as a linebacker, it's his body. Because you and I talked about this, like he's a kid that could maybe outgrow that linebacker position because he's a pretty long kid and maybe be a guy that provides some Viper depth, perhaps. But, he could also just, you know, ref- get refined, stay as big as he is, but just kind of refine and not actually add a lot of mass. Like Josh Burnham just came yeah. to Notre Dame as 20 pounds like that. I mean, just you're like, dude, this kid's going to keep growing. I don't know that no one that Preston Zinter necessarily has that kind of frame. He could just be up to 235, 240, and just this is what That's I am. It, yeah. And I'm just, I'm just ripped up and strong and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it would be unwise to just assume he's not going to be in the conversation as well. So good call on that one, right? We have Beef Eater. What's up, Beef Eater? What happened to the three-back set we ran against Ohio State? Well, I think it's one of those things where it's not necessarily – it was more of an Ohio State thing. You it's know, not trying a to of the offense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Specialized. Doesn't mean they won't bring it out this week, but it was more of a, a an OSU wrinkle. Yep. We had Irish Gordian Knott. What's up, IGK? At this point, how close is Notre Dame Clemson to truly being a rivalry that requires its own traveling trophy? You know, I'm going to look at something here real quick, Ryan, and I want to find out what Notre Dame's future schedules are and see if I can see when Notre Dame plays Clemson again because that's going to tell me the answer to that. So they've obviously played each other a lot recently. The yep. next time they play, however, is not till 2027. So four, five, six. So you're talking about four more years before they play each okay. other again. Then they play each other in 28 and then in 31. So there's another stretch coming up here soon, assuming they don't throw this all out. Because that's the other sure. thing, too, is this could all get thrown out with the three new teams in the league. They may Very have to quickly. redo some of this. Yeah. Uh, they could also just say, hey, look, we're going to make Stanford a non-conference game. Or, hey, Notre Dame, that's going to be an ACC game, but you know, just, you're know, just you still going to play Stanford every year. I don't know how they're going to do it. But right. I, I don't know that I would call it a rivalry after this game 
because they don't play again for four years. And I don't know that Clemson's in a position where I have any faith that they're going to like bounce back and be a playoff team in the next couple yeah. of years. They could, but I just, I don't see that right now. I don't, I haven't seen coach Sweeney would be willing to make the changes necessary to do that. Could this off season, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe Tyler from Spartanburg pisses him off enough to, to do that. But you know what, what's funny. Uh, DM ND 13 said he wouldn't be shocked if that was like some kind of plant by Dabo. And you know what? Wouldn't shock me at all. What I mean, I yeah. don't think it was, but if you found out that it was, would it surprise you? Wouldn't surprise me at all. Cause coach Sweeney has been a master at that finding ways to kind of create that us against the world mentality. Like remember when sure. they were like winning titles and he was doing that, that, that Roy stuff, you know, they were on the Roy bus. It was Alabama and the rest of you. I'm like, bro, you guys just beat Bama. You're not on the Roy bus anymore. You know what I mean? You you're on the bus with Bama or Bama's now on the Roy bus, you know, but right. that's just who, that's just what he does. I mean, he's, he's, he's great at that. So, uh, but no, I, I don't think it's his own. It's his own rivalry. I mean, it's it it's it's more like Miami than it is USC, Purdue, Michigan State trophies. You know, games that have more of a um, a, a trophy at stake. You right. still only played each other what eight times, eight nine times, yeah. I think something like that. It needs to be a so, nearly annual thing for it to be start to be a rivalry, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, like I, I don't I don't yeah. think that that be that far removed. Right. So it, it can be, you can consider it a rivalry. I'm okay with that. I mean, they've played each other six times. This will be the seventh time or six times since night, since 2015. You can kind of call it like a mini rivalry, like Notre Dame had with Miami from like the mid 80s to 90. But that's as, that's as far as it goes. It's like a, a, a yeah. it's not a, what I would consider like a rivalry worthy of a traveling trophy. Because again, Ryan, to me, to have that, the trophy, you got to play regularly. Because otherwise you win one game and then it sits at your, we've had this trophy for four years. I'm like, yeah, because I haven't played you in four years. you know. And then you get into the whole right. Notre Dame hasn't beat Clemson in X number of days or Clemson hasn't beat Notre Dame in 975. Yeah, because they haven't played in those 975 days. That's not the kind of trophy that deserves a, a, a or the game, a, a rivalry that deserves a trophy in my view. Agree. We had a question from Lucky Ducks 512 says, Would you rather start with the ball against Clemson or be on defense? I would rather be on defense against Clemson, I think, because I don't like I I just think that the, the biggest strength advantage you have is your defense versus their offense. And so, like, let's get out of the yeah. way and maybe force an early turnover. I don't know, but like I just think that I'm getting my sh biggest strength on the field to start the football game. That's just kind of my thought process. I'm an offensive guy, Ryan. And I've always had the mentality of I want the ball to start. That's always been my mentality. But I've also said, if I'm the head coach, I want my best unit on the field unless yep. there's a reason why. Notre Dame's best unit is the defense, and there's no reason why you would want to put your offense on the field first. Because to yep. me, if you trust that unit, here's how you think the game's going to play out. You kick it out of bounds. They started at the 25. The crowd's going to be super ramped up, and they're not going to be as ramped up when our offense gets on the field after three and out or turnover. That that's what you're you're setting the tone with your best unit. And then now your offense gets the ball, better field position. You know, maybe you're not all the way back to the 25. You know, the crowd's a little quieter because you just sacked Kate Klubnik on third down or whatever the case may be, and you're in a much better position. So th there's no reason to to for you to choose that. Now they could start on the you know, Clemson wins the toss and defers, then Notre Dame's gonna start with the ball. But if you're Notre Dame, I want to start with my if I if it's up to me, I'm starting my defense. And for me to say that, it 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 says a lot because I'm normally a I want the ball kind of guy. Yeah. But that's just not who this team is. And that's not a knock on the offense as much as it's an, it's a it, acknowledgement of just how good this defense is. Yep. Agreed. We had a super chat from Tyler Evans who says, besides the, this game, I'm looking forward to the Sooners versus the Oklahoma State Cowboys, who win for the first time in the Big Ten in the Big Twelve. Um, is who win for the final time? I think it's supposed to say oh, final, final time. time. Final yeah, time. Because this is going to be the. Uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, Ryan. What are your thoughts? I mean, I I want to say Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma's. Uh, I think o Oklahoma's reeling, and yeah. I think Oklahoma State is is playing well. But this yeah. is also a rivalry that Oklahoma's dominated in recent years, and it is. It is. You know, I, I, I think I, this I game could go it. either way, though. To be honest, like I mean, if you gave me a who's more likely to win, I would probably say Oklahoma because I think they're a more talented football team than Oklahoma State. 
But if Oklahoma State's able to continue to feed Ollie Gordon and play just good, solid defense, which they have been playing recently for the most part, I think Oklahoma State could pull off that upset. I do. Yeah. I mean, I but I again, I think the odds are in Oklahoma's favor, but would I be shocked? or I, I don't even want to say shocked. Would I be surprised yeah. if Oklahoma State won? No, I wouldn't be surprised. I think that they have a formula. They have a really good running back, and they have a couple good defensive players, Colin Oliver, and then they the, the Martin kid, the inside linebacker, that are pretty good. So if they forced a couple turnovers and Ollie Gordon had a game, I wouldn't be surprised if Oklahoma State pulled that upset off. Oklahoma's won seven of the last eight, including last year when Oklahoma wasn't even that good. The only Oklahoma State team that beat Oklahoma was the Fiesta Bowl team from 2021. They beat Oklahoma, and they barely beat Oklahoma. And that was a yeah, that was a decent Oklahoma team, but that was an Oklahoma team that you know was coming off of a 13 point loss to Baylor and barely beat Iowa State. You know, I mean, it wasn't a, a vintage Oklahoma team. It was, it was good, but it wasn't great. So. <laughs> It just look, the thing too, Ryan, is you, you talk about wanting to be able to, to establish the run. They got to find a way to get, get the ball down the field. I mean, that's the thing is like they've got to be able to find some ways to – not that they got to throw it a bunch because that's just not who they are. I mean, Al, Alan Bowman's got eight touchdowns and five picks on the year. You know what I mean? Like they're just yeah. – they're just they're a running football team. But last week against Cincinnati, their quarterback only completed 17 passes. That's it. Yeah. But – but – he threw for 286 yards. It's a big place, right? 17 to 34, 286 yards, two touchdowns. Like you can hit a couple big plays in this game. That's where you can have a shot to, because if you can just soften Oklahoma up just a little bit or make them pay for committing to stop the run, that's how I can pull off the upset. I would love to see it. I would love to see it. But, um, and I do like the fact that it's in Stillwater, but yeah. it's, you know, it's it's I just need to see it, but I really hope I really hope so because Oklahoma it, it, to me, if they lose the second game, they're they're not a they're not. I mean, I don't see them finishing ranked ahead of Notre Dame in my view. Probably not. I, I would yeah. I would be surprised if that happens. Yeah, because I also don't but, think they're going to beat Texas in a rematch. I don't. Yeah, also also agree there. Also agree there. Mike Gundy is uh he's very interesting by the way. He had a yeah. funny little story about, about Brian Bosworth that went viral, which was pretty weird. I couldn't tell if Bosworth's response was joking or if he was genuinely pissed. I hope he was joking. Oh no, I I I, I think he was just joking around. I, okay. I didn't I didn't because I didn't I didn't I think anything I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think tell. anything Gundy said was like disrespectful or anything. Not he at was all. just talking about an experience, you know what Not I mean? Not at like, all. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I I just I couldn't tell by reading the tweet, but it was it was pretty funny. He's like, now I could yep. kick him in the shin and run like heck. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, I like I'll have these. those uh, those college stories to reminisce on. Jim Holleran. Thank you so much, Jim, for the question. With the blitzing stats you both gave, how important are the blitz beaters this week? Other than Navy, it seems the blitz beaters have been non-existent. Both of your thoughts go Irish. What? I thought they had pretty good ones against Pitt this past week. I mean, a lot of those we, RPOs and yeah, I mean, not, I, not I thought, consistently enough throughout the season, but like we have seen you know, games where they've been very effective. Yeah. They have been. I, yeah. I thought last week they the, but that's what I love about RPO stuff too, Ryan. Is you know you catch them in a in a stunt where you're you know against the run and you throw that ball behind them or get the ball in the perimeter. You make just like we saw with NC State. You you make one guy miss. If you can get that yeah. ball behind, you make one guy miss. And why did that play go for seventy two? Because when he made that corner miss, there was nobody else out there because they caught him yep. in a blitz. So uh, I, I would say they 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 have run plenty of blitz beaters, Ryan. They're just not always effective, right? That's right. the other thing is like just because it doesn't work doesn't mean they're not doing it. But uh, I think the pit game was a good start because the, and this is what you and I talked about last week is is Pitt is arguably the best coach defense that Notre Dame is going to face this year the rest of the way. Not, not all year, yeah. but the rest of the way. Clemson's clearly a, a close second, in my view. Clemson has better players, but philosophically, they're not as far that far off this year, Ryan, where in the past, Clemson was more of a base, do your job, defense this past season, under Venables. They were a crazy blitz from everywhere team. They're kind of like right in the middle of those two this year. Yeah, And I would say they're a lot more like Pitt this year than they've been in the past, where – they're going to activate their linebackers. They're going to try to shut down the run. They're going to trust their corners to play a lot of man coverage. That's Pitt. So you got a glimpse of it this week. It's just that Clemson's guys are a lot better than the Pitt guys talent-wise. 
in my from the games I've seen, a lot of a lot of the pressure that they're bringing outside of the inside linebackers from Clemson is off the slot a lot. They bring that guy kind of off the edge, whether it's a safety rotating down, whether it's a nickel. And I think that Notre Dame really needs to have some slot answers to those pressures Mm -hmm. because the best way to beat pressure, a lot of people like don't think about this, but like the best place to beat pressure is to throw into the pressure, right? Where the pressure is coming from, because that's the vacated zone that they're that they're going to replace the pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So whether that's a bubble, whether that's just like a, a quick glance route, whether that is just something, you know, we just call it an arrow route, which is basically just a slant right into the to the inside seam there, right? Like you had to find something to find that vacated area off the slots. And I so RPO would be huge this week. I don't know if that's in the plans yeah. or not, but like it would be big against Clemson potentially. And we saw a couple of blitz beaters against against NC State that worked as well. They had a great blitz plan against uh, Navy that worked very effectively. Because remember the big screen to Audric Estime. They knew a pressure was coming. They knew they had nobody blocking. Hartman just has to find a way to get that ball off to Audric. Yep. And 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 um, the, but because sometimes a blitz beater is a run, and mm-hmm. that's what that long touchdown run was was kind of geared towards. Like, look, they're going to be bringing guys down. If you catch them, if you catch them, it's going to go a long way, and it's going to be similar yeah. to to Clemson. I mean, that's what. That's what Miami got him. Miami caught him. My and here's something I would like to see Notre Dame too do as well. Ryan is one way you can limit the effectiveness of their pressures is to spread them out more. And Miami actually did a pretty decent job of that. Is they would line up with some wide pressures and or wide looks, and then you know if, if Clemson would, I think they had like um they brought a linebacker to the offense's left and they just ran right and they just caught him in a pressure where it's like he just ran right to an open hole. And if you can get body on a body, there's nobody there. So sometimes it's going to be running the running the ball off, and because if you would, and the, the reason I say that is if you widen them out, the way that Clemson handles that is they'll they'll kind of bump their linebacker out a little bit. So if they are going to bring him, they'll bring him off the edge, and you may be yeah. able to get a crease, you know, type cutback type run. So you got to be willing to do that as well. Is sometimes be able to spread the field, and then if Clemson wants to play more reduced, and then they bring a nickel guy, and you're throwing a bubble screen behind it. Because to your point, Ryan, the the way that the Notre Dame receivers block, they could they could do something in the screen game in this game. In my if they can catch Clemson in a in a in a pressure where you know Chris Ty, it's you know Chris Tyree in space and you've got Jaden Thomas blocking Nate Wiggins and the safety's got to come from depth. You know Jordan Faison in space, Jaden Greathouse in space, one of those guys in space where the safety's got to come from depth because you just dominated Sheridan Jones or. Or Nate Wiggins in the, as a blockers, I could see that being a big advantage for Notre Dame in this game. Absolutely, and you said that in a text to me beforehand. It's like yeah. run at him, screen at him, like get this kid physically beat him up, basically, you know, you legally beat him up, beat him up with blocks, him yeah. Up. Yep. And then that's going to impact your ability to maybe make some plays on him in the pass game, in the fourth quarter. Yep, agreed. Reza, Notre Dame is playing in the national championship in 2024 or whatever year. Where are you watching from? Who with? And are you watching as a fan or in your normal capacity? I'll be in the press box, so I'll be. Wa- I won't be. I'll be watching as a fan on the inside, but right. externally, I have to. You know, there's no cheering in the press box. I will more than likely, Riza, be watching at home. I don't know who would be there. If it would just be me and the wife. If my dad would watch i i don't know exactly who would be there as far as company i would watch as a fan during the game and then i would come on the post game show and be very excited yes, yes. <laughs> this very excited but very professionally excited so yes, yes. yeah uh, you know what ryan like depending on where the game is and, and the makeup of our staff like if i could get tickets to that game i would consider having someone else cover the game and just be there as a fan like not for the semifinal game, but if they won the semifinal game, and then I'm looking at the championship game, like I, I would, I would do something like that. Like I, yeah. I know we're professionals around here, but if they win a national championship in the post game show, I might bring a whiskey on. I'm just putting that out there. All the that universe. I have asked for you to do, Ryan, my my biggest <laughs> rule. I have two big rules. Number one is yes. don't be drunk. There's a difference between well, I won't, having a I shot. won't be drunk. No, there's but, a difference yeah. between taking a, a celeb- <laughs> celebratory shot as opposed to that. Uh, and then the other one is be clothed. Those, those are my two requirements. For I, 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 could not, I could not promise either one of those things in the post game <laughs> show after national championship. Fortunately, I have not I have the ability to kick people out of the chat if Ryan does show up. We're going streaking. We're going down to the quad. 
back to the gymnasium. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that'll that'll not be happening. That'd be funny though. But no, I mean it would, you know, that would be uh, yeah. I I hope we can answer that question for sure in the next couple of years. Yes, Risa, that'd be phenomenal. It'd be a It'd lot be of fun. Very nice. It'd be very nice. And it wouldn't shock me. I mean, right now, in the next five years, if if yeah, I've said this, in the next five years, I predict their name won the title. I just their their the trajectory is there for them, in yeah. my opinion, to have a shot to and, do that. And I think the best version of themselves could be just about any team in college football right now. And yeah. in the past. Haven't felt that way. Have not felt that no. way. So it's, it's getting better. It's getting better. Yeah. Like 2019, if that Notre Dame team in 2019, let's just say they would have beat Michigan and gotten to the playoff, yeah. their best version of themselves still loses to LSU by at least 14 points, at least. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. 2020, the best version of themselves would have needed Alabama to turn it over three, four times to win that game. Just, it's just, they've, they've never been that team. Right. Could they have beaten Clemson and Alabama in 2018? Maybe. Maybe. I still don't think you had the quarterback to do so. So, yeah, they've never been that team where they play their best, they can beat anybody. They needed to play their best and have the other team not play well. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the difference to Ryan's point now that I wholeheartedly agree with. Carlos Garza, and I think we had a couple of these questions that were oh. similar. Oh. Yep. Sorry. I pulled Carlos is down. I always do that. I always like, I'll pull it up and then we start talking about something else and I'll, I'll get Carlos is back here in a second. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Mark Avalone says if Sam Hartman wants to get drafted, even if he has trust issues with certain receivers, doesn't he need to risk it and still throw deep outside to give himself a draft evaluation shot? Uh, no, Mark. I mean, he's going to get a draft evaluation shot because those deep shots that you're talking about outside the numbers and such, they're already on his film, right? Like you've seen that from Sam Hartman. And also, I would say for me, like the one thing that we miss sight of with what is a guy being drafted to potentially do on the next level, right? If Sam Hartman is most likely a day three quarterback, somewhere rounds four through seven, and he's going to be drafted to potentially be depth to a room, to be a guy that if situation goes bad, you bring him in and he's not going to kill you, right? That's why guys, I mean, name some of these backup quarterbacks, Chase Daniel and and some of these guys that have just been sticking around, Josh McCown Jared, for the longest Ryan, time. Ryan, Jaron Hall was all yeah. – who, who did he replace? Somebody got hurt this week. Was it Kirk Cousins? He's Vikings. Vikings, yep. That got That's hurt, good. so Jaron Hall steps in as their starting – you know, as their quarterback. I mean, think about that. He was at best, at best, the fifth best quarterback Notre Dame faced last year. At best. Yep. Yep. And he's, he's – But he's – He's a decent talent and he's probably not going to kill you, right? Like exactly. he's probably not going to kill you. Exactly. Yeah. And he's he's a good enough athlete where he can, you know, not get himself killed. He can extend plays and yeah. you know, things like I, that. Yes. I, I I talked about this before the before the season, Mark, but like I think Sam Hartman is a really good college quarterback, a really good one. Mm -hmm. But I, I always struggled with the people that are like, could he be a first round pick? I'm just like, no, he's never going to be a first round pick. Could he be a late day two pick that goes in the late third rounds because he has a great year? Maybe. Right. But like more often than like most, the most reasonable outcome was going to be, he was going to be somewhere on day three, whether that is, but the question would have been, is he going to be early day three in the fourth round? Is he going to be mid day three? Or is he going to be a guy that's a little bit more towards the end of day three? Like that's just kind of what he's because what Sam Hartman projects to be on the NFL level is a backup. And I think he could be a really good one. And that's, there's no shot mm -hmm. at that at all. Cause I just mentioned like Josh McCown and a couple of uh, chase Daniel chase. Daniel has made a lot of money in his career for not yes. being a very good NFL quarterback. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's where we are. That's where we are. Yeah. I just want to be clear. To the people in the chat, I don't care if you guys are unclothed. That's not my business. I just need to make sure that the people that are on the show with me are clothed. So you guys do you. I just need to make sure that my staff is clothed. That's the big, uh, the big part of it. So um, I, I might have to close my uh, my uh, DMs on Twitter during that day, though, because now people are going to send us unclothed pictures, and I can't let that happen. Please don't send those to me. Send those to Ryan all you want, but please don't send. No, those I, to I just said I'm going to close it, so they can't send it to me. I guess unless they want to tag me on X, but that'd be weird. Uh, Jim Holleran says, "How many points does it take to beat Clemson this week?" I mean, if they get to 24, I feel I feel good about. It's funny, it, 20, 24 I, literally popped in my head first. Yeah, so that's yeah, like, that's a number. I think if Clemson brings their A game, 27 might be needed. Yeah, you know, like 27, 21, 27, 24. 
if Clemson brings their B, B plus game, 24 gets it done in my view, yeah, as long as your true. offense doesn't like give them points. That's the only, that's the only thing. I would just be so surprised if Notre Dame gave up like 24 more points to Clemson. I would just be surprised. I really like this game could very well be a 23, 21 game, a 24, 20 game, a 24, 17 game. A lot like, like the I, 2015 it, game. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it, it feels like that type of game. I would be surprised if we're sitting here and it's like 35, 31 fine. Like I would be very surprised. Well, if that was the. Uh, I mean, Ryan, if we're being honest, that's kind of what last year's game was like if you take away the turnovers. I mean, Clemson doesn't have those two bad picks, the pick six, and then the one that gave Notre Dame at ball at the 12-yard line. It's a 21-14 to 14 game. So, you know, and, and then you say, well, if you don't have the block pun and the first bad interception, maybe DJ's not throwing the second interception that gets returned back. I mean, there's all those type of things. You had yeah. two big turnovers and a block punt for a touchdown that, that – broke that game open. You didn't win by three touchdowns because your offense came out dominated. I mean, you scored 21 right. offensive points. And one of those touchdowns came off of a what, 12-yard drive, 13-yard drive, off of a pick. So I could see something similar this year, hopefully. And and, and here's the thing. If the offense gets into the 30s on its own, like, you know, maybe, maybe one short drive, but, you know, pretty much on its own, that's a heck of a performance against this defense. It really is. I don't know why it just popped in my head, but did you see the over-under on the Iowa-Northwestern game this week? Wasn't it like sub-30? It's the lowest it's ever been. 29 and a half is the over-under. That's under. crazy. It's nuts. That is yeah. just crazy. Um, <laughs> to, to your point, Ryan, let's remember too, folks, that Florida State's offense scored 17 points in regulation against Clemson. Their offense. Yeah. Now, they scored 24 points as a team because they had a, fumble, a long fumble return for a touchdown. But their offense only scored 17 points in regulation. That, I mean, that's, yep. This is not an easy team to score on. Uh, NC State scored 24 last week. One of seven of them came on a pick six. Miami beat, beat Clemson. They scored 28 points. They needed two overtimes to get there, right? You see what I'm saying? Right. Like, you know, Duke is the only one that scored a lot of points with only their offense. But again, you're in a similar situation. They got a bunch of short fields because of turnovers. You know, they right. weren't putting a lot of long drives, to, scoring drives together against against Clemson. They had a, you know, 50, 57 yard field goal drive, 40 yard field goal drive, 33 yard touchdown drive, 49 yard touchdown drive. They had one touchdown drive that that started out be, beyond midfield. That's it. And so this is just this is a harder team to score on. So I say their 23 points per game allowed, Ryan, does not do justice to how good this defense has been this year. Agreed. It does not. Michael Johnson said, without Mitchell Evans, could we go four wide with CT, Chris Tyree, and Holden Stace? Well, yeah. I mean, they they do that already with Mitchell Evans. I mean, we've seen them do that with Mitchell Evans at times where they'll, they'll kind of go move him around. So, yeah, I think what they'll do a lot of, Michael, is is lining up in 11. This is – he's advocating for like 11 personnel. Lining up yep. in 11 personnel, moving Holden Stace around, getting different, you know, angle blocks and things like that. And then also sometimes you can move him around to, to get him in a leverage in the pass game, you know, or you can just line up in trips. Or you can line up in three-by-one with him backside or line up in two-by-two two with him into the boundary, line up. Two by two with him to the field. There's a lot of different things that you can do uh, yep. with Holden Stace, and but you but a lot of that too, Ryan is they're already doing. They're doing a lot of that. What they did a lot of that with Mitchell Evans. I, what I would say is I, I would hope that the route concepts would be a little different because I think Holden Stace is a different type of tight end. His strengths sure. are a little different than Mitchell's. And and but yeah, Michael, I I could definitely see that man. I could definitely see that. Agreed. Carlos Garza's question before. I'm sure you saw or heard, but what are your thoughts on the Dabo rant? Of course, he... I, I had no problem with yeah. it. No problem what? with it. Like, there's, there's, the fans have this thing where some, not all, I think most people want a professional level of respect between the coach and the, and the, and the, and the media. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to ask tough questions and, you know, you can ask tough questions in a respectful manner. And, yeah. But you just – you that was not like, oh, if I was there, I'd say this, this, and this. Well, okay. Well, then don't be surprised when the coach says something back to you, right? right. Like Brian Kelly went off at me one on me one time at a press conference, and I've never been like, that was bull crap. What a dick move. I said, you know what? I should have asked that question better. 
because the way mm-hmm. that I asked, and I didn't read the room, like he'd gotten asked like three really dumb questions in a row. And I don't know who the who the guys were. I think they were just like, wait, force me. It's like re- really dumb questions in a row. And I could see him getting mad. And so my question was going to be talking about they really struggled with their pass game in the first half, but then made changes and and really ripped it up in the second half. I was going to ask him, what led to your struggles in the first half? And then, hey, you did a great job in the second half. What what led to that? Well, by that point in time, I never got to the second part of the question. I should have led with the first part, right? Yeah. Asked it better. And then I could have got to my, okay, what was the reason that you had the issues in the first half? And so you can ask a coach, coach tough questions, but there should always be a level of respect. And if you ask a fair question and the coach responds like a jerk, then that's on the coach. Like if Dabo would have gone on his rant because the kid said, hey, you know, um, are you disappointed that the team is four and four with all the success you guys have had? And, you know, you're making a lot of money. I just kind of felt this team would be a lot better. I think Dabo and then Dabo then went on that long rant. I'm like, dude, you're overreacting. You're being kind of a jerk. But like yep. he listened for like several minutes. This kid just bash him. You say you're a, reli- a man of religion and all. I mean, it's like, you know, tar- use, misquoting I, nothing. There's very few things that bother me more than people that are improperly proof. They proof text the Bible verses. They'll say like, well, the Bible says this. I'm like, I, I've, okay, how about you read the two passages before and the two passages afterwards? Because you're going to realize the context in which you're using it is not appropriate. Because people think they can just take a Bible verse and just take it with no context and apply it to however they want to apply it. That's not how the Bible, how studying the Bible, interpreting the Bible works. And so you use something about humility and stuff like this. And it's like, after a while, he just got sick of it and he went off. Yeah. And I thought it was a wholly appropriate. If you want to step to a coach and disrespect him and diminish everything he's done for the previous 12 years, don't be pissed when he claps back. And right. I, I was, I was all for it. I was all for it. I had, I had no, I had no ill will towards it at all. I actually thought it was very deserved based upon your kind of framing of it as far as like how the coach was coming at it. I mean, how the uh, person on the call was coming at it. Look, you gate, you give Dabo Sweeney media availability and he didn't say anything in response that was incorrect. He didn't say a word where I was like, that's not true. You're deflecting. You're putting blame in wrong situations. All he said was misrepresenting what that guy said. He didn't do that either. All all he said was that he's proud of what they've built. And I think that there should be a deeper appreciation for what we have built here because he's right. Clemson before Dabo Sweeney was not very good. I mean, they just weren't very good. Clemsoning was a thing literally early on in his career as well. And then he gets over that hump and now he has built a really good program. Who's having a down year. I I really think that there just needs to be a little bit of a take a step back. Can we appreciate it and be like, yes. hey, this isn't up to the standard you've built, but like you are the one that is literally why there is a standard at Clemson right now. You are Correct. the reason that there's a standard. So, yeah, I don't Ryan, I don't have any problem. Clemson played football from 1896 to 2006 before yeah. that da- or 2007 before Dabo was hired. They won one national title, one, and it was 35 years before the one that they won with him. He's won two. He's taking you to the p- playoff, what, five times? Yeah. He's won six ACC titles, six, seven ACC titles. Like, you've yeah. had 12 years in a row of 10-plus wins. They're having a down year, and you want to come at them like that? Like, that doesn't mean you don't – look, they need to be asking tough questions of Coach Sweeney. They yeah. need to be asking him tough questions because some of the decisions he's made have led to them being 4-4. Four and four. This yeah. isn't a thing where you had a bunch of injuries and, and you know, things fell apart and it just – you lost to some really. You had a tough schedule, and you you lost this guy, and you lost that guy, and you lost this other guy. And it's just it's just been a tough year. But we'll bounce back. No, that's not what's happened this year. I think he has made decisions in recent seasons that have hurt the program, uh, or or caused prevented it from building on the success they had under Deshaun and uh, Taj. Because everybody says, "Well, you just had two generational quarterbacks." They were pretty freaking good before Deshaun Watson was their starting quarterback. With with Taj Boyd, they had two really good teams under Taj Boyd. He beat LSU, a Les Miles LSU team, in a bowl game, and he beat a Urban Meyer coached Ohio State team in a major bowl game, the Orange Bowl. Yeah. So it's not like they were okay, and then all of a sudden Deshaun Watson shows up, and they're great all of a sudden. And then, you know, like they they had a nice run with three quarterbacks, and you can challenge him on the job he's done the last three years, and I think that's fair game, but there's a way to do it. 
And this guy opens up media. It, this wasn't even media availability. This was just he opens up to fans can ask questions. This is, I think just some fan. It was a fan. And yep. Yep. I'm never doing that again if I'm him. Like, you know, this is how it's going to be. But, but no, he's correct because it, you can be critical of what you're seeing now without disrespecting the job that they've done before. I think that's right. really what it came down to. And, right. um, yeah. Keep everything into perspective. Keep everything into right. perspective. This this is, struggle of a season does not exemplify Dabo Sweeney's tenure at Clemson. It does not exemplify right. the entire thing. So and uh for those Clemson fans wanting to get rid of Dabo, be careful what you wish for. I'll just leave <laughs> it at that. Want, want Tommy, be careful Tommy what you Bowden wish for. back. Yeah. Call Tommy Bowden and see if that'll work for you. Well, when the guy I think that's probably what set Dabo off is when the guy compared him to Tommy Bowden. <laughs> Not so that he doesn't respect. like Tommy Bowden. Like he's a good, yeah. good guy. I mean, he hired Dabo. I mean, so they, they, right. I'm sure they have a good relationship, but like, but he wasn't a great um, coach. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, Nathan Milton with the super chat says biggest college football scandal. You recall, how does Michigan compare? I mean, pony Ex pony Ex 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 express is the first thing that pops to me for like the SMU stuff back in the day with the trans am and all that good stuff, right? All those recruiting violations. That's yeah. the one that pops. Well, but, there's, there's some stuff that happened at Michigan state the last 10 years that no one's talking about for some reason that just has gotten kind yeah. of brushed under the rug stuff that happened in the D'Antonio era, the stuff at Bryles that happened at Baylor was pretty bad oh, that's too. Bad. That was bad. Yeah. It was really you know, bad. that, 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 that's, Florida that's, that's urban different. Meyer was pretty yeah. bad. too. Those man. are, those are different types of scandals that yes. in real life are far more important than what's happening in Michigan. Right. Cause you're talking about sexual assault and, and, you know, criminality happening and things like that. Like yeah. th those are much more important, but if you were yep. to say, what's the biggest, football related scandal this is up there i mean this is up there yeah. you know and and there's been some like point shaving stuff that's happened in the past like remember the um i don't think he did it when he was a player but there was a former notre dame kicker that got in some trouble with some some point shaving stuff when he was out of college uh, pender gas i think is his name okay. uh, there's been some things like that that have happened but i mean this is a pretty big one to me because yeah. it's something that's having an impact on results of games and results of games right impact people's lives because sure. you get you get fired you get promoted you don't you know all those type of things and and just it's almost to the point now where some of the stuff they're saying is like when somebody's like yeah there's there's he was on the sideline of someone else's and i'm like guys come on now we're just getting into like conspiratorial stuff right and you know me ryan i'm all for a good conspiracy because in the last five years most of the good, good conspiracies have come true but it's like you, now we're just getting a little crazy. And then you see the pictures and you're like, holy crap, I think that might actually be him. Like yeah. the depth of how deep this goes. Like, I mean, this the initial accusation was bad enough. And if yeah. it turns out to be true that like they had tapped into Ohio State's computers and like it just it's just like, man, if this stuff is true, you just can't justify anyone being employed there that's currently employed there. You just can't. Yeah. And I hate to yeah. say that because that's impacting people's lives, man. And maybe not everybody knew about it, but it's kind of like if you knew about it and didn't and, and didn't participate in it, but you also didn't say anything. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, you you, you know, you're you're not an accomplice, but you know, you're someone who could have stepped up and made and 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 stopped it, and you chose not to. Yeah, yeah. A couple of these, a couple of those pop for sure, like in the mind. And I agree that this recent one is probably going to be up there in the controversy. I mean, the Penn State one, obviously, with the you know hiding a sexual predator. For yeah, a very like long those time things are terrible. Like, yeah. And yeah. and but like the Baylor, but those to me are in a different category. Yeah. And I, you know, it's just it's hard for me to compare that to this because then it's kind of like, well, then I can't really talk about this one because at the end of the day, this is just about football. Right. So this right? is just more like a category of like, you know, yeah. deflate gate and like that type of right. stuff. Right. Point like shaving. Right. You know, right. buying players, putting ineligible players in the field that you don't know ineligible, right. things like that. You know, like it, it's it's hard to compare that like what's going on now to send. Cause like, you're like, if you're going to try to do that to try to make this like, see, cause some people are doing that. Well, this isn't like what happened at Penn state. I'm like, that's kind of a, a really cheap way of trying to defend your program. Right. That's a different deal. 
that's a different situation. That's something that always needs to be dealt with, but it's, it's not football related. This is what you cheated, sure. right? Yeah. Just because you didn't allow the horrible things to happen that happened at Penn state and Baylor and these other places doesn't mean Vanderbilt right under James Franklin. Yeah. Remember some of the accusations about what happened there. Some of the hazing yeah. stuff that happened in Northwestern and Penn state yeah. and, and different things, right? Th- that, that doesn't mean that this still isn't a big deal. Right. And I know you're not saying that, Ryan. I'm, I'm responding to like yeah. some of the spin coming from Michigan people. Uh, well, this isn't as bad as that. I'm like, yeah, but it's still wrong and it right. still needs to be dealt with. And I don't know that they will, but it's just it's fascinating because if if half of the stuff that they're accused of is true, this is like, just like put them on the death penalty. No, don't put them on the death penalty. <laughs> but, you know, they should probably have a new coaching staff. Like right. a full, yeah. like that, anyone that's, that's, that wasn't a player needs to be fired. That, that's I mean, that's why my mind went to SMU with Eric Dickerson and Craig James and those guys because I was like, that literally was the death penalty. They were like, we're done yeah. here, folks. Like we're done. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know that I support that. You're right. Uh, be, it's just because I, I, I mean, to me, that stuff doesn't really fix anything. You know, fire anyone that was involved with football or this thing. You know, so I'm firing. Every staffer, every uh, GA, every assistant coach, every every anyone that would could any any way possible had anything to do with this, right? I'm firing ball boys because now the latest allegation is the ball boys were signaling whether it's run or pass, which I some of the stuff I don't buy. Now I think some of the stuff is just piling on, you know, and and it's like how, how I mean, you guys are really training your ball boys to be able to make calls and know if it's run or pass. Like, come on, like. Yeah. But still, that's what I'm saying. Even, if, even just stuff, half man. this stuff is like, if the Michigan State thing, if the if the ball boy thing, and the it's Ohio the State thing. thing turn out to be not true, but the yeah. other stuff is the Michigan, you know, the sideline at Central Michigan, that that's still, you all deserve to be fired. Well, Jim Harbaugh didn't know. Then he should even be more so fired because he I, had I always, that I little control that over stuff, his program. Yeah. I always hate right? that stuff. He didn't, he didn't know. Sure, he didn't. Isn't okay. it your One, job? He didn't. To know? Yeah. Right. One, he did. Two, if he didn't, then he's a very irresponsible leader of men. And so, like, no yeah, longer deserves the, that responsibility. So, either way, yeah. it's a fireable offense. Right. Because if you're so that many... oblivious to your program, really? Yeah. Yeah. And Come Nathan, on. it's such a hard question, too, because there's been so many recruiting scandals over the years. Like, I mean, I think back to like Florida during the Urban Meyer era. And remember Ole Miss with like the Robert Candice's oh, of the yeah. world and all that type of stuff. I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. been going on forever. I mean, it's yes. just, you know, even recently, Jeremy Pruitt, you know, yeah. and I uh, went with the McDonald's bags or whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like somebody says, should Michigan get a bowl ban? No. Fire the coaches and let the kids play in the bowl game with you know new or or let the coaches play in the bowl, coach in the bowl game so the kids can have a chance to go play. Just say you don't get any revenue from it. That's the, you want to hurt them. Like this is what this is what will happen. They'll do some kind of penalty that'll just punish the players. That, that yeah. you know, primarily punish the players. And you know, fire the coaches with cause, which means no buyouts. Let them coach the season out. Let them coach the bowl game so the kids can have their final shot yep. and then make sure they get zero revenue from bowl games. That's what, like that's what every penalty should be about is that right there. Make it a financial one and take away scholarships that that should be punishment for these things. You know, the whole, if I go and put last year's Ohio state game on Ryan and watch it again, does the final score change at the end? No, it doesn't. The game's already no. been played. Ohio state lost Michigan won. It is what it is. So I hate the whole vacating wins thing. You want to hurt teams. You want to get teams to stop cheating. Make the financial penalty, make it sting. That's the only way to get, you want to get people to stop cheating, make the punishment so severe that they would never dream of doing that again. You know, and um, I'm a big believer in that. Big believer in that. You ever see the movie Swordfish? It's an older movie to me. But there's okay. a scene in there. John Travolta is like this anti-terrorist guy that's kind of also a terrorist. It's a very interesting plot twist. But his basic response was their goal was to basically if a, if a, if a, a terrorist group or a country commits an act against the United States, the consequences are so severe that you and no one else will ever dream of, of doing something like that again. 
right? That's mm-hmm. the kind of – but the only way to do that to college football programs is there's one way to do that, money. Take yeah. their money away, and that's it. That would that would hurt them. Yep. We had another super chat from Tyler Evans. Give me a head coach you would love to play for if you're a five-star kid. It doesn't even have to be a five-star kid, Tyler. I would love to play for Kyle Whittingham. Would love. Yep. I've always wanted to play for Kyle Whittingham. He <laughs> – does it the right way and he develops, man. So yeah, love Kyle. that. Doesn't shock me at all that that's your answer. You know, just because guy as well. Yeah. Well, well, in your your middle linebacker, that was what you did, yep. and that is the Gary kind of Patterson that, would have been another answer. Yeah, for me, but but that's yeah, the kind yeah. of program that 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 you know would have been tough, would have been demanding, you know, yep. but it would have been like right up your alley, and uh, from every from all accounts, a good man as well. Yep. So yeah, I wouldn't mind playing for him. Um, and I've heard Salt Lake City is very beautiful. Never been, but here's sure very is. beautiful. Sure is. Sure I mean, is. there's a lot. I, I wouldn't mind. I'd play for Dabo. I'd obviously play for Marcus Freeman. The, you know, there's a lot of guys that I wouldn't mind playing for. I'd th- play for Dino Babers just as a human being. I don't. I don't think he's that good of a coach. Dino, you know, Dino is a really, good he's guy. A really cool guy. He's yeah. A really cool guy. Um, yeah. I'd play for Mike Elko in a heartbeat. You know, he, yeah. he's another one that would I would think would kind of be up your alley too, Ryan, because he's he's a he's a guy that cares about people does things the right way class guy but also very demanding and is all about we're going to yeah. be physical and 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 well coached and all that so there's a lot of guys like that the list is pretty long of guys that I would play for cuz there's I, we don't we don't talk enough about this there's a lot of good guys coaching football we we have this perception like all these coaches are d-bags and cheaters and all that and I'm like okay there are certainly some and and, and a lot actually in a lot of ways but there's still also a lot of guys i got a buddy who played in the NFL and and he would say, like, he hated how the media would c- cover the NFL because he'd like, they would always talk about whatever Ryan Leaf did wrong or whatever player was getting in trouble. He's like, like 95% of us, we went home to our wives and kids afterwards. We weren't doing all this kind of stuff, you know, and, but nobody ever talks about that. We're going out and doing, spending our time at charities and helping out our community. Nobody talk would talk about that. They, you know, front page of the news, Ryan Leaf says this or so and so did that. And, you know, that's just kind of, kind of how it is but there's there's a lot of good dudes out there my i know one guy i wouldn't want to play for and that's jim harbaugh and then i also wouldn't want to play for that guy down in columbus either hard pass on that one yeah so i always had a soft spot for mac jones mac jones always seemed like a cool dude to me too so mac brown mac brown i mean mac brown yeah. mac jones someone said mac jones in the chat and he got me he got me messed up there but mac uh, brown, although i could see mac jones being a coach someday I could be. I would not want to play for Mac Jones. He seems like a turd, but that's another conversation. Oh, is he really? As a, as a. Oh okay. uh, yeah, he's he's a he's apparently very uh, very hard to deal with. Apparently. Okay, yeah. dude, you're not yeah. that good. That's crazy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, Andre Tonsil, what I need to see from Notre Dame from last year against Clemson is similar run game, but passing game go for 250 yards would be nice. And seeing our receivers score three or four touchdowns. Thoughts. Great. Man, if Notre, I if Notre Dame's receivers score three or four touchdowns, this is going to be a blowout. And you I have mean, a similar seriously. run game to last year as well. Yeah. Like, all right, you're going for 500 yeah. this game. I mean, it's, like, just, it's going to be a blowout. I mean, it's going to be yeah. a major blowout. I honestly, I just want to see growth, Andre. Just be able to make some plays in the pass game. You don't need to, if you throw for 250 and four touchdowns, that's phenomenal. I don't think yeah. you necessarily need that. This is the four touchdowns part. But I mean, getting it close to 250 passing yards is going to, I think, kind of be needed, though. I do, I do think that. I don't yeah. know that the four touchdowns are needed, although I would gladly take it. But you're gonna ha- look. Clemson's not gonna let you run the ball like they did last year. I just they're just they're That'd not. Doesn't mean you can't run on them, but like for you know two sixty eight with no pass help, that ain't happening. If yeah. you get to two sixty eight again, it's because you softened them up with some big plays in the pass game. I just don't see that happening. And as you pointed out last year, was an anomaly, Ryan. Yeah. If Notre Dame blows them out again and Sam Hartman throws for like a hundred yards, it'd be like, I don't, I don't even know. I don't know football anymore. I don't, I don't I give up trying to predict. We're not doing any more. Yeah. IB predictions have been negated. It's not. A, yeah. No, we're not doing any more. <laughs> we had a question from Eric Santini said thoughts on Cam Hart or Xavier Watts, not making the Jim Thorpe semifinal list. How many guys are on a semifinal list for the Jim Thorpe, by the it's... way? Let's see. 16 here. or something, um, I feel like. Yeah, it's a it's a high number. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Benjamin Morrison made it. Okay. So yeah. And like I mean Nate Wiggins isn't on there. None of the Clemson kids are on there. Yeah. I see Cole Bishop's on there. Didn't he? Yeah, he good player. Uh good Denzel player. Burke, Cooper DeJean. 
Okay. Renardo Green from Florida State. He's I mean they're Travis Hunter, he's like missed half the year. Uh and just and got torched and okay, whatever. That's all about reputation. Kool Aid McKinstry, of course. Jacob Robert Robinson from BYU, Willie Roberts from Louisiana Tech, Jalen Simpson from Auburn, Malachi Starks from Georgia. Yep, he's been really good. TJ sure. Tampa from Iowa State, and then Trey Taylor from Air Force. Uh, mm-hmm. Ben Cam Hart not being on there doesn't surprise me at all because these I, things I are a lot know. about numbers. These things are about yeah. numbers. And I think that's the thing that's hurting Nate, a kid like Nate Wiggins, too, is like he's given up no catches for no yards, but it has it's like a, what, what, one pick, no picks. Right. Because they don't throw right. at him. Nobody throws at him. Uh, and it, 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 that's how – I mean, this is the same award that gave the uh, the the final award to uh, Ahmad Gardner's teammate. Like Kobe Bryant, no one yeah. on the planet thought that Kobe Bryant was better than Ahmad Gardner, but he had better stats because nobody threw at Ahmad. That's – you know, that's why these awards just don't and, mean, it's and not, it's not mean a whole lot. They they also gave it to Travis Hodges Tomlinson last year when Clark Phillips was the obvious right. choice to win that award right. last year, like so obvious. But, but he played. Yeah, Cam know, he Hart on a great team, right? Yep. Cam Hart like, does not surprise to TC, me at all. Eric. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Cam um, Hart does not surprise Xavier me at all. Watts, does that surprise you at all, Ryan? Him not being on there with what he's done. I mean, did they like have uh, the votes in before the last couple weeks? Like, when do the when's the voting come in? Like. No, nah, it, pr- it probably just happened over the last few days. I, yeah, I would. I mean, guy I would leads think. the nation in interceptions, so he's... And should should he be on there? Yes. Am I surprised he's on, not on there? No, because I think there's also preseason name recognition that goes into that award, yeah, which we've talked so about. I'm not shocked. Yeah. Not shocked. Yeah. Before the year, not not many national people knew who Xavier Watts was. He had zero career interceptions. Like he wasn't on the radar, right? So yeah. yeah. Now I could be wrong here, but I know that some of the awards. You can put a guy on the finalist that wasn't on the semifinal list if something like if a guy does great. I know some of the awards you can do that. I've yeah. seen guys that weren't semifinalists get put on the finalist wa- list. I don't know if the Jim Thorpe is one of those. I have no idea. Not sure. Which that. one do which sure. one do you vote on, Ryan? I know you vote on, the on Davey O'Brien. Davey O'Brien. Davey O'Brien. Okay. Yeah. Are I you don't think that's how that works in Davey. So okay. Yeah. Meaning like you can only pick from the from yeah, the other group. Yeah. I think it's like top. 32 then they read it down to 16 then it goes to eight to four and then the finalist or whatever so yeah yeah Yeah. joe allen with clemson being near the bottom in the red zone how a red zone percentage how aggressive should the defense be right off the bat to keep their spirits down um i mean my thing joe is you should be as aggressive as you always plan to be like that's my thing. I don't. I'm not a big believer, Ryan, in saying, "Hey, let's let's do something beyond what we do because of this." You know, to hurt their emotional psyche. If I'm going to do more than I normally do, it's because schematically it makes sense because their left side of their offensive line can't handle stunts. So we're going to run a third more stunts than we normally run. It'd be something like that. Their their quarterback doesn't handle this disguise coverage very well. So we're going to run that more than we normally do because he's bad at it or it gives us some advantage or limits a disadvantage we have. It's not because I want to mostly break them. Does that make sense? So like I'm not yeah. against what you're saying, Joe. I, I think there's merit to being a- aggressive at times, but with Phil Maffa, with the receivers they have who aren't big time players, the last thing I want to do is be overly aggressive and then that one time you make a mistake, that running back's creasing it for a big play. Happening at Florida right. State, right? Or or you catch a slant route, Benjamin Morrison slips and falls, and then there's nobody else out there, 60-yard touchdown, and you just let that team get back in the game. So you've got to balance that too a little bit, Ryan, with when it comes to getting a little bit more aggressive than you normally would. Uh, I still think this team is a – you don't need to be more aggressive to dominate them. You're athletic enough to dominate their all. I mean, they had to move Tristan Lee into right guard because they're having issues there. Now they've got Colin Sadler playing left tackle. Like, just do things to take advantage of that. Yeah, sure. But I, I'm not necessarily being more aggressive. It's just, just keep doing what you're doing, yeah. man. You have a winning formula. Don't mess yeah. it up. <laughs> Don't mess. That you already have- has some aggressiveness built into it. You have already held some pretty good offenses down based upon just doing what you do. 
I'm not reinventing the wheel this week. I'm not changing my philosophy. Al Golden, this defensive staff, just do what you do, cuz. I, I trust you guys. I trust you guys at this point. So don't overthink it. Yeah. Agree. And that's what we talked about, right, Ryan, in the in, in Monday's mailbag mm-hmm. is what we're finally seeing from Al Golden is he is trusting his players. He's not feeling like I have to out scheme the other team all the time. I mean, there's some really good scheming going on, but it's within the framework of I trust my kids to play at a high level. Don't go away yeah. from that for some reason because it's a big game or because you've you have an apparent weakness. Like you do things that would be normally what you would do to take advantage of where you can whoop this team. I still yeah. want to see the D line be turned loose because if you can pressure this kid with your D line plus a linebacker, which is kind of who Notre Dame is, he will throw three or four balls that you have a shot to pick off at least. He just will. That's just who he is right now. And yeah. uh, I want to take advantage of that. And I'm disguising the heck out of my coverages because which Notre Dame already does because he, yes. he will guess wrong. That's the other thing too, he Ryan. He will guess wrong because he he's a young kid. He's a, he's a true sophomore. I mean, that's the thing is like, he's what's he making? Uh, this will be start number nine of the season. So 10th career start yep. young player. Sounds right. We had a question from Michael Johnson says, where are we with the defensive lineman from Simeon Academy in Chicago? Of course, that's Christopher Burgess, 2025 defensive end. Uh, Michael, basically, I mean, Christopher has now been on campus four separate times since he's been offered in the Pot of Gold offer event on St. Patrick's Day. He was most recently, obviously, there for the Ohio State game a couple weeks ago. Where we are is that Christopher has been very open to the fact of he is not making a college decision until his mom comes on him on these trips and takes a look at every place that he likes, right? So it's been a feeling out process as far as what schools does he like? Notre Dame is obviously one of those schools that he really likes. You wouldn't come back to a place four different times if you don't like a a place like that. So Christopher Burgess is high on Notre Dame. I think that Notre Dame will be in it until the very end. I think Notre Dame will end up having a very good chance at Christopher Burgess. His mom is going to have a great input. I think it's very telling that he wants mom to be able to see all these colleges and help him make a decision. The only place, to my knowledge, that she has been to with him so far is Ohio as Notre Dame, excuse me, against Ohio State a few weeks ago. So that's a good sign that the first school that he wanted his mom to come look at with him was Notre Dame, and mom really liked Notre Dame a lot. So I think Notre Dame could have a potential ally with the mother, which never hurts anything. So I think that they will have a shot in the end. It's just about now you have to outlast some other really good schools. Alabama has offered this kid. Ohio State has offered this kid. There's going to be some schools that are going to be pulling and prodding, trying to get him back on campus, try to win over the mom. I think that Notre Dame has a chance to have some state power in that recruitment. Yep. I want to respond to something real quick in the chat. It's a comment okay. from, let me find it here real fast. It's from Jace. Uh, nope. Where was it? Ricky Harris says, I saw an article where they said Gino Gadouli is a big time candidate for the OC at Iowa. I truly hope that he doesn't that leave too. Iowa. Seriously. Here's the thing. Let me just say something to you all right now. He may well be. 90 plus percent of the initial here's who the candidates are are nothing more than a media people just putting out lists that they think should be in it and then just saying this is who the candidates are that's usually not who it is like i saw lists for the when the o coordinator job was coming up last year i saw people putting here's candidates and i'm like i know for a fact four of those guys are not candidates for this job but people just <laughs> kind of put out their lists and sometimes it's agents spreading that kind of stuff sure. for various reasons. And sometimes it's because I want to stay, but I, I want more money. Uh, I put zero stock in any list you see today about who yeah. the OC is going to be at Iowa right now. I Zero stock in it. That doesn't mean yeah. that when it comes that time that Gino may not be there. And if he does leave, that's a bummer. But, you know, Notre Dame's in a position where there's going to be a lot of quarterback coaches that are going to be like, Gee, do I want to go to Notre Dame and work with Kenny Minchie, CJ Carr, and Deuce Knight? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. I mean, you know, <laughs> they're going to have no problem hiring a new quarterbacks coach. Um, and and that's not in any way a, a, a shot at, at Gino Gadouli because he's part of the reason why it's so attractive because he had a big role in getting Deuce Knight to Notre Dame. So, but I, I, you know, I wouldn't worry at all about those type of lists. There's four weeks left in the season. I promise Listen, you. Not right now. The time yeah, I promise really you, Gino Gadouli is not concerned about that. Gino Gadouli is focused on beating Clemson. That's what his yep. focus is on right now. So I, I just, 
I say it every year. It's worth mentioning again. When you see these lists being put out, the vast majority of them are just people throwing out names. That, yeah, that's that's what it is. And they'll say, well, this guy worked with that guy at this place. And so, sure, he's a candidate. And I'm like, no, no, he's not. We had beef feeder. This is Brian. Would you rather be responsible for cleaning, pressing Harbaugh's dirty khakis or buying Ryan Day his seasonal Victoria's Secrets wardrobe? Um, that would be easy. Uh, I would do the one for Ryan Day because all I got to do is buy it and drop it off at his freaky house. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud of I'm not cleaning and pressing some other dude's clothes. Are you crazy? No, I would, um, Probably a lot yeah. of boogers in the pockets too. So yeah, it's just weird. Out. Who knows what's going on with those things? So yeah, I want no part of that action. Like if I'm buying something that's hasn't been worn yet, I'm buying it from a store. I'm putting it in a bag and I'm dropping it off. That's pretty much it. Right. But the the moral of the story is, is I would do neither job. But if I had to do one, yeah. Plus the seasonal whatever you said is a seasonal thing where the yeah. khakis. I can just I just have this vision of Jim Harbaugh having this huge closet. And it's like okay, 85 just different pet khakis in a row, you know? It's like nah. I and a bunch of sweater that. sweaters and yeah. some hats. Yeah, yeah. That's all he's got. Yeah. Yeah. He's got like 20 of the just the block M hats, you know, just yeah. like lined up. Yeah, I could see that. Nathan Milne, if Michigan scandal shakes their 2024 class, are there any you would like to call Notre Dame? We've, I mean, we've talked about yeah, that, right, Brian? Like, it's just, it's just kind of, it's, it's, there's not many spots left, Nathan. I mean, the only guy that would make any reasonable sense is interior defensive line is still a need that you have in the Owen 2024 Wafel. class. So, like, if yeah. Owen Wafel wanted to come and you could fix that relationship, like, maybe, you know, but yeah. like, I know, like, one name that people keep bringing up is like Andrew Sprague. It's like, Notre Dame already has four offensive line. You don't need Andrew Sprague. And you could have had Andrew Sprague probably right. if you wanted Andrew Sprague and you chose not to. So, and if you're going to go after a Michigan offensive lineman, I'm going after the Frazier kid, not Sprague. Like, that's who I would. He's he's not even their best offensive line commit. He might be their – I don't know what the rankings are. Maybe he's he's highly, more highly ranked, but I – no. Um, I mean, there's – the we talked about this too, Ryan. Some of their better recruits are – like Jordan – we talked about Jordan Marshall as an example. He's a good football he's player. Good, I like he's him. just not as good as the kids in their name already has. So that's really what it comes down to. There's just nobody. Th their class is significantly better than Michigan's. Significantly. Yeah. And Michigan doesn't have a bad classroom. They have some decent players in there. Solid it's just they're just not as good as Notre Dame's. It's a it's better class than the way they had the last couple of years, which is good yeah. for them. But yeah. 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 Throwing hands Irish. Does Aldrich Estime have a chance of winning the Doak Walker Award? I would say yeah. I think he has a chance. Um, a chance. I mean, because... He's one of the leading rushers in college football. He's also a very, like, because this stuff shouldn't matter as much as it does sometimes, but he's got a really good personality, right? And mm -hmm. voters, I think, will like that. Like, you see him in some of the like, hype videos Notre Dame does, and you, you just kind of know that he's the guy offensively for Notre Dame at the running back position, mm -hmm. you know? So I think he has some power in that regard because I, I also don't think there's – like a couple of the guys that I thought preseason could be that guy really haven't done that this year. I mean, Who like, are some of those, Blake, right? what's that? Who are some of those? Like Blake Corm, obviously. Like, like Blake Corm was one, but he's he's been good, but he hasn't been like as good as he was last year. Rocket Sanders is one that's been banged up for Arkansas. Trey Benson's been okay, but not as good as I thought he was going to quite be this year, as far as production wise. Like I just I just thought there would be a couple guys that might be in that conversation more. I mean, right now I would say if I had a vote today, it would probably be Ali Gordon from Oklahoma state, but like it does Aldrich have a chance. Yeah. Aldrich has yeah. a chance for sure. I'm sure. He has the, a chance. The, and the problem with a guy like Ali Gordon, I would say Ryan is he's his not because he's just, it goes back to what you said earlier, who the heck knew who Ali Gordon was before the season. Right. And so there's going to be in order for a guy like that to me to win the award, his numbers would have to be so nuts that he's, that he's able to do it now it, he could do that i mean if he's if he's if he stays on the, the the track that he's on now right where if you just look at his last four games he had 136 against k-state 168 against uh kansas 282 against west virginia 271 against cincinnati you divide that by four and you go then times four so you're adding another 800 yards on his current numbers if he stays on that path yeah he'll have a shot 
But the thing that Audric has going for him on the flip side is Audric will have some more spotlight games where he played well. And, and he'll have the brand recognition, the Notre Dame brand recognition. That, that'll help him. And I think that's partly why Notre Dame kept him in the game against Pitt last week for one more series. I mean, it was easy to see. He was at 93 yards. They put him in for two more carries. He got over 100 yards. They took him out. We didn't see him again. I'm, um, you know, in the yeah. third quarter, I don't mind doing that. I wouldn't want to see that in the fourth quarter. And, you know, if, if he can go out and have a, a repeat performance against Clemson of what he did last year, 100 yards, and then the next two games he's going to roll. He's going to be sitting there close to 1,300 yards, 17, 18 touchdowns. Yeah, he'll have a shot. He'll have okay. a shot. Just, I would say he's probably more in the he'll be a finalist as opposed to he'll be the winner. The guy, Unless he yeah. just finishes really, really strong. Really, because he's right now like I think 11th, uh, ninth in total yard, eighth in total yards, but he is 17th in yards per game. Right. But he also is tied for fourth in touchdowns. And he's got a a pretty good yards per carry average right now. He's 6'2 right now. So, again, if he can finish strong against teams that aren't great, he'll have a shot. But have a shot. I, I wouldn't vote for him. I, I wouldn't expect him to get it today. He's going to have to finish really strong. Because to your point, Ryan, the kid from Oklahoma State is red hot. And if he goes out there on Saturday and just rips up Oklahoma, I mean, now he has a spotlight game. Because, like, that's the thing is he doesn't have a spotlight game right now. If he rips up Oklahoma, then he now has a spotlight game where he's, you know, he starts being recognized. Nobody cares what he did against Cincinnati. Do that against Oklahoma on national TV, now people are paying attention. It shouldn't be that way, but that's just the reality of the way that it is with a lot of these deals. We had Serena Spies, 22, the question. If Notre Dame punches Clemson and they punch back, is Notre Dame geared to give other punches and the last one? I, I think that this team is, Serena. Like I, I I do think that they can be. I would have had my my skepticism in past years, but I really think that this is a little bit of a different wired team. You know, like and I think that for the most part under Marcus Freeman, Teams have responded, right, as far as, like, when there's adversity in, in, from a game-to-game perspective and even from in, in games for the most part. And last week against Pitt, we'll talk about this, after, you, know, uh, you know, recently, but that game showed me something. It, it really did. I talked about that on the Monday show. As far as I could have seen past Notre Dame teams in some capacity coming out of that game a little bit flat and winning, but, like, not making you feel like, wow, like, they really dominated that football team from start to finish. I think that Notre Dame has some resiliency to them. I think that they are wired that way because I think that we talked about it yesterday. I think that Marcus Freeman has programmed into them the one play, one life mantra as far as the next play is the most important one. The next game is the most important. I do not think that they will back down if Clemson benches back. Agree. That's what they've shown, right? And and I also think Clemson's a team that at least defensively will also punch back. Like that's the thing. I just it would be so outside of Clemson's character to just get punched in the mouth a couple times and quit. I just, I don't see them being that team. I mean, this, it's one of those things, Ryan, we talked about where Notre Dame could win this game and even win this game convincingly. And you're still, walk, you're still happy that you got a bye week next week. You know yep. what I mean? Like physically, you're, you're going to come out of this one bruised up, you know, and, and, and the teams that, that can beat Clemson, the ones that can punch back. And the teams that have the athleticism to neutralize the perimeter. Well, this Clemson team doesn't have those same perimeter advantages they've had in the past. And that's a big part of what's uh, kept them down. So, yeah, Notre Dame is certainly capable, certainly capable of that. And, Ryan, that yes. is uh, – we got one more okay. that we have to ask. I'm going to read it from Mark Avalon. Okay. Halloween candy, Ryan, when it comes to handing out, are you a snack size or a full-size house? Uh, we get a lot of traffic here, so I'm a snack size guy because I'm not made of money. I'm sorry, Mark. I'm just not. <laughs> sorry to the same. kids in the neighborhood, but I'm I'm not same. made of money. Yeah. yeah, same here. We are a uh, we are a a, a um, snack size family yep. as well. So I was going to be Plus the Grinch this year and uh, just give him like erasers or something like that or pencils, but I was nice. Yeah, Angela and I were joking about that yesterday. She's like, "What do you think if like." Gave out toothbrushes, kind of jokingly, and I was like, "I do not want to be known as that family. I do right. not want to, that. No Apples. thanks. 
Actually, yeah. I would love an Apple. If someone gave me an Apple, I'd be like, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the Apple. It's always a good Apple, yeah. but whatever. Yeah. We got you some, know. we had some, um, I don't know, safety class and all that kind of thing when I was a kid that they talked about, like, you know, you got to check your food because they can put like razor, razors and things. And one of the examples they gave was an Apple. So I just, for the rest of my life on Halloween, I was freaked out by getting an Apple just that's because funny. I was like, there's going to be a razor blade in it. So, Oof. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it, Ryan. That's going right. to do it. There was a question about uh, something, but that'll be addressed in the show tomorrow. So that's going to do it. Why don't you go ahead and take us out of here, Mr. Roberts? All right. Well, everyone, appreciate you all for, as always, for joining us for the show today. Again, we talked a little bit about Notre Dame's huge opportunity against Clemson. We also gave a little bit of a breakdown earlier in the show. So if you joined us late here, Make sure you go back and listen to that section of the podcast. Of course, we hit the mailbag at the end. Before you leave, if you could just hit that like button for us, make sure listening on YouTube, you subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, five-star reviews are very much appreciated. Make sure you're also subscribed to that channel as well. Brian will be back for his solo show tomorrow. So make sure, again, notification bell on. Go to boards.irishbreakdown.com. We'll have some further recruiting and team intel. Before I went to bed last night, I gave a little bit of an update on Ivan Taylor. So make sure that you guys are tapping in to the message board at boards.irishbreakdown.com. We will talk Nine to you again. Tonight. Nine o'clock tonight. Yes. CFB Nation. Uh, God football yep. playoff review, rankings review show. Check it out. Which, which is why you should hit that notification bell. And you would know that that show is coming up with the CFB Nation on the CFB Nation channel. Make sure you subscribe to CFB Nation on YouTube as well for that live show tonight following the college football playoff initial ranking coming out. That's Brian Driscoll. I am Ryan Roberts. We will catch you all next time on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.